Support me on GoFundMe if you want a real human voice for explanation. The link is in the description. Let's continue the video. In the late 1800s, a remote area of Sweden was on the brink of fairy tale fame. Little be known to them for being home to the real life Sleeping Beauty. On a little island called Okno off the coast of the eastern part of Sweden, 14 year old Carolina Olsen lived with her family. Carolina had a large family consisting of her mother, father, and five brothers. Her family was a farming and fishing family, like many others on the island tucked away from the rest of the world. Carolina Olsen would never have become a household name if it weren't for one very, very odd occurrence that happened when she was a young girl. On a day unremarkable from the rest, Carolina would fall into a 32-year slumber. Her appearance unchanging, and awake to a completely different world than she fell asleep to. Here is the real story of the sleeping beauty of Okno. The story begins on the 18th of February 18th, 76, when Carolina was returning home to her village, crossing the ice of a frozen river when she fell. Some say she fell through the ice, nearly drowning, but being pulled to safety at the last moment. Although other sources claim she tripped and hit her head, knocking a tooth loose and resulting in a toothache. Whatever the truth, she did make it home safely to the modest cottage she lived in with her family, but with a sore face and a toothache. Her father looked her over when she came over, and despite bruising and scrapes, she appeared perfectly fine. Then Carolina's toothache got worse, and she suffered from excruciating headaches. Out of the ordinary for her. Her father, a local fisherman, and her mother thought it was down to witchcraft. It was 1876. Superstition was high, and the village of Okno was quite isolated. Knowing there was nothing they could do that evening, given their remote location and financial strain, Carolina was told to go to bed and see what took place the following day. However, when she fell asleep, she did not wake up. In fact, she would not awake for decades. She went to sleep at 14 and not to return to the waking world until age 32. Her parents were desperate to wake her up but couldn't afford a doctor at the time. They tried a number of methods to bring her back to consciousness, including a hot flame across her skin and even pricking her with needles. First on her body and eventually under her fingernails. It was no use. Carolina was still fast asleep. When their daughter did not wake up after a few days, and they were unable to rouse her, they sent for medical help. In the meantime, as the days passed, they took to force-feeding their daughter two glasses of milk and sugar a day. And when they finally had a doctor come look at her, he would tell them that she was in some sort of coma. Although why she was in a coma was anyone's guess. The doctor kept up to date on the case, and as the months stretched into a year, and the girl continued her slumber, he implored the medical community to try and figure out what was going on. Other doctors made their way out to the secluded island to see Carolina for themselves, and it was noted that her hair and fingernails seemed to have not grown during the entire episode, and that she had not really lost any weight, despite subsisting on only a mere two glasses of milk a day. In fact, she was in surprisingly good shape. Her muscles seemed to have not really atrophied at all. It was as if Carolina was in some sort of state of suspended animation. In July of 1882, a full six years after she had gone into her mysterious sleep, Carolina was still sleeping away. And her concerned burdened parents had her hospitalized in the city of Escorsham, where doctors tried to revive her with electroshock therapy to no avail. Frustrated doctors would throw up their hands and diagnose her with a severe neuropsychiatric disorder called dementia paralytica, also known as general paralysis of the insane or paralytic dementia, but number one could be sure. And it is unlikely that she actually suffered from this. The family was told there was not much to be done except wait and hope for the best. And so they waited and waited some more. Years passed, seasons changed. The world evolved around them. Family members passed away, and Carolina slept, occasionally moaning or tossing, and turning, and even sleepwalking or mumbling in her sleep on occasion. 
but never fully waking up. The only time she ever showed any sort of true reaction to the outside world was when she was seen to cry when her brother passed away in 1907. Yet, she did this even as she remained in her strange comatose state. Carolina's mother would also die during this ordeal, and a full-time caregiver was hired to tend to her. This maid was baffled that Carolina's hair always seemed to be clean, and that it never grew nor did her nails. She also noticed that sometimes when she left and came back, pieces of candy she had brought with her would be missing, leading her to be suspicious of the whole thing. Yet Carolina would never rouse from her sleep, no matter what anyone did. After years of this, it was also rather odd that the woman did not seem to be aging normally, looking much younger than she should have, as if her whole metabolism had been slowed down. This would continue for 32 years until one day, she just suddenly woke up. On April 3, 1908, Carolina suddenly and without warning sat up in bed and began crying. The maid entered the room expecting this to be just another sleepwalking episode, but was astonished to see that Carolina was alert, awake, and looking about the room in confusion. The family was immediately called to her bedside, but the young woman seemed to not recognize her now-grown brothers, and was not in a state of shock and panic. Over the next few days, she did not say much, and showed an almost painful reaction to sunlight, but with some difficulty she began speaking again. Under questioning, it was found that she had no memory of anything since falling into her long sleep, except for half-remembered dreams and nightmares. And when doctors examined her, they were puzzled that she seemed to have no negative side effects from being bedridden for decades. Although she was technically now in her late forties, she looked more like she was in her early twenties. She was subjected to mental tests by psychiatrists, and was found to have full possession of all her cognitive abilities and intelligence. Although she was having difficulty adjusting to the world that had changed so much around her, the news got out about what the media was calling the Sovereign Scan Paakno, or the Sleeper of Akno, and Carolina was soon a minor celebrity. Of course, there were skeptics. After all, how could a woman remain asleep in bed for over three decades with no ill effects to show for it? and having only subsisted on two glasses of sweetened milk per day. The idea was that her family had been in on it, and the whole perpetual sleep thing had been a ruse to keep her hidden away from the world. Another idea posited by the Swedish psychiatrist, Harold Frederström, was that she had suffered some sort of deep psychosis state rather than a full hibernation. But that still didn't explain why she looked so incredibly young. Carolina would end up leading a content in normal life right up into her death in 1950 at the age of 88, always insisting that it was all true and taking any secrets she had to the grave with her. We are left to wonder what happened to Carolina Olson. Interestingly, there have been other similar cases to hers, although not nearly as dramatic. In 2012, a 15-year-old British teen by the name of Stacy Comerford fell into a deep sleep that she would not wait for from two months. The cause was speculated to be a condition known as Klein-Levin syndrome, or Sleeping Beauty syndrome, but it is still poorly understood. Was Olsen perhaps suffering from a particularly spectacular case of this? How do we explain her ability to come out of it without any significant mental or physical health effects? or her lack of aging during the ordeal. We will probably never know. And the case of the Swedish Sleeping Beauty remains an unexpected
seen alive again. The search for the boys lasted two weeks, and culminated in a gruesome discovery beneath a large tree on the shady banks of Gypsy Creek. And had it not been for a prophetic dream, the whereabouts of George and Joseph Cox might still remain a mystery. This story is fact, not fiction. It isn't a tall tale nor urban legend. The story of the disappearance of George and Joseph Cox is horrendous, alarming, and draws much skepticism given how it played out. The strange tale of the lost children of the Alagamis began on the morning of April 24, 1856, when the boys followed their father into the woods. Samuel Cox, who had just finished breakfast inside the family's primitive log cabin in Bruce Hollow, grabbed his rifle after he heard his dog barking. The dog had managed to tree some small animal. And Samuel, desperate to put meat on the table for a family dinner, bolted from the cabin. He was so eager to shoot the trapped animal that he failed to notice that George and Joseph had followed him outside. This area of Pennsylvania was densely wooded. Even to this day, the woods in that part of the mountains are heavily forested and deep. You can easily be lost in them. The boy's mother, Susanna, thought the boys had just gone out after their father and that they would return home shortly. When Samuel turned up at home alone, no boys in sight, that worry and fear started to set in. The parents realized their two boys really were gone, somewhere in the woods. Samuel scoured the area around his house, but could not locate them. He asked neighbors in the surrounding area for help. But after a long search, no trace of them could be found. Hunters, trappers, neighbors, and everyone from far and near joined in the search. As time went on, over a hundred people were involved in the search for the missing boys. Large fires were built on bridge tops, in hopes that the children would see one of the fires and make their way to safety. The searchers came up with one theory as to the boys' location. They set their sights on a nearby stream called Bob's Creek. The stream was gushing with melted snow from the change of seasons. They figured it was near impossible for the boys to have crossed the other side without drowning. Unfortunately, the search didn't bear any fruit. They were unable to find the boys, not even a trace of them. On April 20th, 6th, suspicion fell on Samuel and Susanna Cox. It was thought that they might have their children in hope of gathering donations from a sympathetic population. However, the family's cabin and garden were searched, but no bodies were found. The local lore is thick with speculation on the boy's demise. A witch from Somerset County and the Dowser were even consulted in searching for the remains. But the Dowser found nothing and the witch, despite claiming to know the children's location, led a search team through the woods for hours without finding anything. According to the legend, the night after the disappearance, a local farmer Jacob Debert heard about the missing children, and remarked to his wife that he wished to be able to dream of their location. On May 2, 1856, he had a dream in which he walked a path through the woods, past a dead deer, a child's shoe, and a fallen birch tree, and eventually to a corpse of birch trees in a small ravine. Here, he found the bodies of the Cox boys. The dream reoccurred on two following nights. The farmer told number one, but his wife about the dream. However, he felt that the dream was prophetic, and on May 7th, he told his brother-in-law, Harrison Waysong, who recognized elements from Debert's dream. Thus, the two men decided to make a search, culminating in the discovery of the bodies just as the dream had described. Under birch trees in a small ravine reached along a track with a dead deer, a child's shoe, and a fallen birch. Jacob Debert and his brother-in-law, Harris and Song, were remembered as heroes, and the day the boys' bodies were found, the church bells rang through many communities throughout the Allegheny Mountains. Once the boys' bodies were returned to the Cox home, church and school bells started ringing from Pavia to Bedford to Altoona, announcing the sad news of the boys being found. Joseph and George Cox, the lost children of the Alleghanies, were buried in Mount Union Cemetery. In 1906, to mark the mysterious tragedy's 50th anniversary, the community raised money to create a monument to the lost boys. In 1910, 
They had finally raised enough funds and a monument was erected on the site where the brothers' bodies were found over 50 years earlier. In recent years, visitors have started leaving kids' toys at the monument. The boys probably wouldn't have had much use for toy cars and stuffed animals in 1856, but it probably serves to accentuate the tragedy and break your heart if you visit the monument. The city of Hamlin, Germany, has a long-standing summer tradition. Every Sunday during the vernal equinox, locals gather in the old town center to retail a lasting tale that takes place in the very city. Deep within the children's section of the local library is an old dusty copy of classic fairy tales. Behind the faded cover, live stories of heroism, nobility, and true love. Stories that eagerly filled the minds of young dreamers everywhere. However, dwelling amongst the once upon a times and happily ever afters is a far more sinister tale. Of rat infestation, broken promises, and the disappearance of an entire city's children. Among those darker tales is the story of the Pied Piper, also known as the Piper of Hamlin. It's a classic fairy tale that only a few have bothered to study the origins of. In fact, most that do know the story consider it simply a figment of the imagination, a tale meant to stir and leave the audience with an important lesson, never knowing that there is truth to the Pied Piper, some basis in reality. The most well-known version of the children's story which was written in 1857, talks about the Hamland townspeople of 1284. This town was facing a rat infestation, and a piper dressed in a coat of many-colored bright cloth appeared. This piper promised to get rid of the rats in return for a payment to which the townspeople agreed. Although the piper got rid of the rats by leading them away with his music, the people of Hamlin reneged on their promise. The furious piper left, vowing revenge. On July 26th of that same year, the piper returned and led the children away, never to be seen again, just as he did the rats. However, the original version of the story written 45 years earlier did not come with the same happy ending. The town's children were lured away to a cave where they were closed until the end of times. The only child that survived in the earlier version of the story was a child who was handicapped. Therefore, the child was unable to keep up with the musically entranced children. Thus, that one child's life was spared. There are many people who picked up this story, writing their own version of the events, right from the very time it happened. The most well-known of all the stories about what took place in Hamlin on the 26th of June 12, 84 are those by the Grimm brothers. They stray far away from simple fantasy. On the interior wall of a Hamlin city house, there reads an inscription dating back to the 1600s. It reads, In the year of 1284, on the day of Saints John and Paul on June 20th 6th by a piper, cloth in many kinds of colors, 130 children born in Hamlin were seduced and lost at a place of execution, nearby Coppin. The loss of 130 children is without question a near-fatal blow to a town, to the population, to a chance at survival. It is remarkable that Hamlin is still standing after that. The harrowing tale of over a hundred children's lives on in this plaque, all because of a supposed piper that led children to their end in the Calvary of Copenhagen. The legend is more than just a tall tale but something that causes local townsfolk to shudder at the thought of it. The inscription is now more than 300 years old, and it still spooks those native to the area. Enough so that the inscription's home within a church has now destroyed stained glass window. The church can be found in the market square, and it is one of the first documented records of the story of the Pied Piper. Even given the centuries-old age of this story, the town maintains that there is allegedly an eyewitness account from the time. In the windows of the historic building, there's the scene of the legendary piper that pushes children inside of a mountain. It explains the episode in an unambiguous way. A piper first freed the city from the rats, carrying them to the river Wester. And then, with gaudy clothes, takes the children on a mountain adjacent to the city where he pushes them in a cave from which they will never return. And what of this 800-year-old tale is really true? And what happened to the children of Hamlin? Numerous hypotheses have been made to explain the episode. 
Someone says that the rats never existed and were added to the story, holding from the 16th century. Someone believed that the Black Death was the true cause of the children's death, a theory largely discarded though because the plague didn't hit Europe until the mid-1347. So it is very unlikely that an entire city was already afflicted over 60 years earlier. Several other theories have been put forth in an attempt to know what happened in the story. The children were taken to the mountains to avoid the contagion of the whole population, with the disease of Korea Sidonum, also called the Dance of St. Vito. About this, there are references in the Chronicles of Erfurt of 1237 and in the Chronicles of Masteric of 1278. Or the children were forced to leave the city for a new children's crusade or for a military campaign. The crusade of children has been the subject of extensive debate and seems to be the result of a misinterpretation of the Latin word pure, which is confused with the word pauper, which means poor. The military campaign, on the other hand, was very common at the time and often involved even the youngest. It's also possible that the children were part of a migration eastward, probably to Transylvania. And maybe the colorful man with the flute was just a really convincing real estate salesman. Another hypothesis, very interesting, came from Jerno Hussein, a local historian. The Baron Spiegelbergs, convinced Catholics, were determined to eliminate resistance to religious conversion in the area and hired a hunter with bright clothes. They had 130 children of the city of Hamland sacrificed over a calvary, like that of Christ sacrificed to save the men near the city. The ordeal could be mount if only 15 kilometers away from the town of Hamlin, where is located the kitchen of the devil, a perfect place to make sacrifices of this kind, and traditionally linked to pagan rites. In fact, the hill Oberberg is described by the oral tradition of the city as a theater of rituals and demonic parties, which were accompanied by the sound of a piper who played during the ceremonies inviting young people to dance. Today, on the Bangal Lausenstrasse, the street where the Pied Piper House is located, where the children were supposedly last seen. Music is banned as a sign of respect. But in the rest of the city, there is everywhere rat iconography. A clock tower tells the story three times. A day. There's a Pied Piper statue and some bars that serve typical rat's blood cocktails. Twice a day, the bells played, also the Pied Piper melody. Whatever the cause of the eerie disappearance of 1284, the children of Hamlin are certainly not forgotten. A mystery probably bound to remain so. Before the invention of the written word, societies of the past needed a way to document their lives, to record successes and failures, much in the way we still do now. The main way these ancient communities did this was through rock carvings, drawings, and paintings. It was through these primitive illustrations, many of which have been uncovered, that we in the present learned about the lives of those who came long before us. Yet on rare occasions, these primordial rock pictures have shown us something else entirely. They have given us more than a peek into another time or place but shown us a story or an image that is truly mysterious. Topped away in an isolated valley about two hours from Milan is a place known for its famously mysterious rock art called Valcomonica. The valley in which Valcomonica is located sits within the craggy mountainous terrain of the Central Alps. It is the largest valley in the area situated in the eastern Lombardy region, inside the Italian province of Brescia. It's a sweeping and expansive 56 miles wide, running through fields, forests, and quiet medieval villages. These villages in the quiet parts of Europe are the ones we see in the storybooks as children, those seemingly untouched by time and the modern world. Valcomonica's villages themselves have been voted some of the most beautiful in Italy many times over. The valley is blooming with plant and flower life that makes it a special place to see. A lot of greenery found in this area is native and unique to it, meaning that it can't be found anywhere else. In 2018, UNESCO named it a World Heritage Site and added it to their list of the World Biosphere Reserves. In addition to this, the valley is rich in history, possessing numerous old castles and Roman ruins. And it has several UNESCO World Heritage Sites, 
but Valcamonica is perhaps the best known for having the largest, most extensive, and complete collection of prehistoric rock drawings called petroglyphs in the world. Despite the outward fascination of the art found on the rocks in Valcamonica, the Italian locals initially thought nothing of them. Most of those local to the region paid no attention to them, thinking them piety or scribbles until 1914. At this time, Gualtarello Leon, an alpinist and geographer, came across them. It was his discovery of the carvings that went previously unnoticed that thrust them into the international spotlight, drawing interest from scientists and anthropologists across the globe. There are over 140,000 formerly UNESCO-recognized symbols and figures carved into the rock all over the valley, but there could possibly be between an estimated 200,000 to 300,000 of them in total. Encompassing over 8,000 years of history, dating from at least the 6th to the 8th centuries BC in the Mesolithic Age, 15,000 to 1500 BC, up through the medieval times, 476 to 41553 AD. They are a unique peek into this time before written history, with many of these carvings capturing in time images depicting the daily life and spirituality of these ancient humans, including animals, plants, and humans engaged in various scenes of everyday life, hunting, magic, religion, war, and navigation, all of them in exceptionally good condition and virtually undamaged by the years and elements thus making them and the history they depict invaluable to the fields of prehistory sociology and ethnology. The expansive carvings have drawn in much curiosity and fascination since their presence became widely known. Notably, they were used as Nazi propaganda during World War II, when Germans, France, Althium, and Erika Trotman began associating the petroglyphs with Nazi ideologies quickly spreading the idea that they depicted a mysterious ancestral Aryan race and providing their proof of their superiority. The carvings were also used for Italian fascist propaganda, and it wasn't until after the war, and in the 1950s, that proper scientific research would start on them again. In 1979, the petroglyphs of Valcamonica were recognized as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, becoming Italy's first such designated site and the carvings have instilled wonder and speculation right up into the modern day. Yet with such a mysterious place stuck in time, it is perhaps no surprise that there have been also many unsolved mysteries associated with it. It has not gone unnoticed that there among all the images of humans, animals, plants, and various geometric shapes are those that stand out as rather different from the rest and not a little out of place. In particular, there are a few petroglyphs that show figures that are drawn in such a way as to make their heads seem too small in proportion with the rest of their bodies, and making it hotter is that they seem to be wearing what can only be described as some sort of protective space suit. These suited figures also have atop their heads what looks very much like helmets that an astronaut would wear, complete with lines radiating outward, as if to convey shining bright light. To make it all even more bizarre, the figures are depicted holding what looks like some sort of mysterious tools or weapons, like nothing seen in any of the other drawings. And in fact, at no other place in the history of these carvings is anything else like it seen. The impression one gets is that these are figures in astronaut suits, wielding advanced tools or weapons. But of course, there is the conundrum that they are thousands of years old, long before any sort of outfit or electric lighting would be available. So what do we make of this? Why would this one set of carvings hold such and no mislooking figures so long ago? Considering their strange appearance and out-of-place nature, it is perhaps no surprise that the strange petroglyphs have been proposed as being evidence that ancient aliens once visited the area and were then depicted by the awestruck ancient people living here. However, Others have proposed that the petroglyphs are merely stylistic artistic representations of some religious idea or even a battle between two men wearing some sort of armor. The images are so old, and the people who etched them into that rock are long gone. So it is impossible to say for sure, but the images are certainly odd when compared to the other, more mundane figures and scenes portrayed at Valcamonica. What are these images, and what do they represent? Are they merely the whims of some long-ago artist? 
a mundane scene that has simply been misrepresented, or something more? There have been many such mysterious petroglyphs discovered around the world. And whatever the answer is, the ones at Valcamonica remain intriguing at the very least. Through history, we occasionally come across those who attract mystery and intrigue. These figures become larger than life and remain inscrutable enigmas. One of those figures is the mystifying woman known as Nina Kulagina. Nina was born in St. Petersburg, Russia, in 1926. As a young and impressionable 14-year-old, Nina enlisted herself in the Red Army. She was assigned to a tank regiment fighting the Nazis of World War II. This was a grim, dark chapter in her life. During this time, Nina endured the numerous hardships of war and violence before an injury ended her military career. After the end of her time in the military, Nina led a seemingly normal life on paper, at least. She went on to get married, settled down, and had children. She was, for all intents and purposes, a housewife. It was during this quiet time in her life that things would begin to get very strange. Nina found herself delving into the ancient archives of legendary cases of powerful psychic individuals. Nina describes the night she realized that something wasn't quite right. I was very angry and upset one day. I was walking toward a cupboard in my apartment when suddenly a pitcher in the cupboard moved to the edge of the shelf, fell, and smashed to bits. At first, she was frightened a bit and suspected that her home might even be haunted. Over time, she began to realize the link between her anger and the phenomena was undeniable. Nina had hazy recollections of her own mother possessing the ability to move things with her mind. Puzzled, she tried to focus her concentration. Initially, she wasn't able to control what appeared to be psychokinesis, or the ability to move objects with the power of the mind alone. It took a lot of practice and patience. Over time, she slowly gained the ability to move objects at will, starting with small light objects, such as strips of paper, cigarettes, and matchsticks, gradually graduating to heavier, more substantial objects, much to her own amazement. Nina's powers grew outside of just inanimate objects. As she allegedly started to manifest other abilities, she discovered she could see what was inside people's pockets, see colors with her eyes closed merely by touching something, and even, by her own accounts, healing people or generating electromagnetic energy from her body. Nina was no ordinary housewife. She mostly kept these extraordinary powers to herself for fear of telling anyone else. After suffering mental problems, she was sent to a hospital for observation. The hospital staff saw firsthand her miraculous and mysterious abilities, previously unknown to anyone. This is when word got out about her, attracting interest from parapsychologists around Russia. One of the first to come and test Nina's abilities was Soviet scientist Edward Namov who quickly affirmed her potent psychokinetic abilities. To test them, he spread out some matches in front of her in an impromptu experiment. Nina quickly demonstrated her abilities, moving them with her mind to the edge of the table and onto the floor. After this, she was supposedly intensely studied by Soviet scientists in numerous experiments under controlled conditions. During this process, the extent of her abilities became abundantly clear and undeniable. One of the most widely tested of Nina's powers was that of psychokinesis. She was consistently able to baffle everyone fortunate enough to witness these demonstrations, purportedly even under the strictest of lab conditions. Among the many experiments carried out, some truly stand out as bizarre. In one test, Nina was able to move objects that were completely sealed in a plexiglass container and to even remove a marked matchstick from a pile under these conditions. In another, she made a ping-pong ball levitate for several seconds. Perhaps the most spectacular one was when she was seated in front of a vat of saline solution, in which hovered an egg, floating there like an insect in amber. Nina was confirmed to have no way to physically reach it or affect it with any sort of trickery. And with some amount of intense concentration, she was able to allegedly open the egg and separate the yolk from the white, all while puzzled scientists looked on. 
She was even able to put the two halves back together, though only if she kept her focus long enough. Many of the experiments conducted with Nina Kalagina were documented on film, including this one. These displays of psychokinesis had profound and measurable effects on Kula Jenna's heartbeat, brain waves, and electromagnetic field. They also caused her discomfort and drained her both mentally and physically. They even caused dramatic weight loss over a short period of time, yet she was always willing to continue these experiments. Other powers were also supposedly uncovered and tested by scientists such as the ability to develop film that was kept in an envelope with her mind, to tell what color any object was without being able to see it, to magnetize or demagnetize objects, and to cause images to appear on paper. All of these were revealed over time, with perhaps the most impressive being her ability to seemingly affect organic tissue and living cells. It was this power that lies at the center of one of her most famous and certainly weirdest experiments of her career. The experiment was organized by Soviet scientist Dr. Gennady Sergeev, who had spent years studying the mysterious woman and running her through countless tests. In the experiment, the still-beating heart of a frog was placed in a solution, which could keep it beating for up to an hour. Kula Gina was asked to see if she could influence it in any way with her mind. Scientists were measuring beats per minute through electrodes they'd hooked up to the amphibian's tiny ticker. According to the Soviet doctors monitoring her, Kula Gina's own heart rate increased dramatically during the seven minutes it took her to mentally stop the frog's heart. It had taken her 20 minutes to prepare for the exercise. Later, rumors would even claim she could influence human hearts, however, this is unconfirmed. As to how she did it, Sujeev would speculate that she somehow was drawing energy in from the atmosphere around her and projecting it at the things she was focusing on. He made electromagnetic readings that he claimed supported this theory. All of these amazing feats were starting to get out into the wild and into international news. It wasn't long before Nina Kolagina was attracting scientists from overseas. In the meantime, Nina changed her name to Tanelja Mikhailova in order to hide and protect her real identity, as she was facing increased scrutiny from the public. Despite this scrutiny, throughout it all, she was said to be labeled the real deal by nearly everyone who studied her. Of course, there were skeptics who waved it all away as illusions, sleight of hand, and trickery. But these experiments were consistently claimed to be under the most stringent conditions. Regardless of accusations of cheating, it has never been conclusively proven that she was ever caught doing so in any of these bizarre demonstrations. In fact, in one instance, she was accused of fraud by a Soviet newspaper, who Regina won a defamation case against her, further propelling her legend. The main problem with all of this is that it is almost based solely on reports coming out of the Soviet Union at the time when the Cold War was going on. Most notably, there was much competition between the United States on many playing fields. Importantly, both governments were engaged in their own studies into psychic phenomena at the time. So there seems to be the definite possibility that the stories of collagenous powers were at best exaggerated or at worst completely fabricated. In the end, there is simply no way to truly verify any of it. All sources lead back to Soviet claims, often with murky details on how these supposed strict environments were carried out. We have no choice but to take their word for it. There was also the fact that despite the Soviets claiming that dozens of scientists examined her, including two Nobel laureates, no less, there doesn't seem to have been any official scientific paper ever published on it at all. This seems particularly odd for such a sensational, potentially groundbreaking subject. Then there is the fact that the videos of her supposed demonstrations are grainy and indistinct, making it difficult to count them as hard evidence. Although Nina Kulagina was without a doubt a real person, there is no tangible way to untangle the fact from possible fiction, and we have no way to really know whether she was a scam artist or one of the most powerful psychics ever. We just don't know. Whether Kulagina was the real deal or not, she stood by her claims for the rest of her life. It has been said that her use of her alleged abilities may have led to her demise. 
Her supposed psychic abilities were said to be well documented as taking a serious toll on her physical health, even causing a severe heart attack at one point in the 1970s, which almost killed her. Over the years, she continued various demonstrations and experiments, but she was often described as looking increasingly haggard and frail. In 1990, she finally passed away at the age of 64, taking whatever secrets she had to the grave with her. So was this all Soviet trickery, the work of a charlatan, or evidence of an enormously powerful psychic loss to history? No matter what one thinks, Nina Kolagina has certainly cemented herself as a true paranormal historical oddity, and a mysterious case that has never really been solved. This is the story of a remarkable man. When faced with the terrible choice of burning to death or falling to his death, this man chose the latter. Our bodies continue to wow us with their resilience and ability to withstand intense physical trauma. We exist inside this seemingly delicate but incredible machine. Every day, we are bombarded by stories that tell us just how focused and intelligent our body is, even when the brain is incapacitated. Is it luck, circumstance, a higher being, or simply a matter of science that keeps us alive through seemingly impossible conditions? In 1944, the world was engaged in the greatest war mankind had ever seen. It was raging in Europe, ravaging that area of the continent. There were massive quantities of airplanes firing red-hot shots at one another in catastrophic air battles. Men found themselves facing extremely dangerous circumstances although perhaps not as dangerous as one man thought. Nicholas Stephen Alchemade was born on December 10, 1922, in North Walsham, Norfolk, and became a market gardener in Loborough before the outbreak of war. When World War II broke out, he left his gardening post to take up arms in the war. He trained as an air gunner and was posted to the 115th Squadron as a rear gunner on their Avro Lancasters. After successfully completing 14 operations, Alchemate's crew were detailed to raid Berlin on the night of March 24, 1945. Alchemate's six-man crew plane, nicknamed Werewolf, was one of 811 planes ordered to attack the German capital that night. Werewolf and the crew carried out the mission which went without incident. On their way back to safety, the crew encountered strong winds that blew them southward, toward the rural area where there was a large number of anti-aircraft defenses. Despite 14 successful missions, all without issue, luck was not on their side that night. Right around midnight the crew and aircraft were attacked by German Junkers fighter. The bomber's wing and fuselage were raised by machine gun fire and immediately burst into flames. Alchemade, as the rear gunner, attempted to defend the men by shooting back. Unfortunately, the windows of his turret had been blown out, and the fire was starting to engulf the entire rear of the plane. The order came from Werewolf's pilot, James Newman, to abandon the crippled bomber. He knew they were done for, and the plane was going down. He gave the order to take their parachutes and jump to safety. Alchemade was not wearing his parachute since the gunner's area was too cramped for it to be worn all the time. So Alka made open the door that separated him from the rear of the plane to access the storage locker that held his parachute. It was then he began to realize how much trouble he was in. The entire back of the plane was on fire, and to his dismay, so was his parachute. The heat was intense and rapidly consuming the aircraft. Almost immediately, his oxygen mask began to melt, and he felt his hands becoming engulfed in flames. He shut the door, but the raging fire began to burn hotter. Nicholas Alchemade was out of options. As he recounted later, I had the choice of staying with the aircraft or jumping out. If I stayed, I would be burned to death. My clothes were already well lit, and my face and my hands burnt. Though at the time, I scarcely noticed the pain owing to my high state of excitement. I decided to jump and end it all as quick and clean as I could. I rotated the turret to starboard and, not even bothering to take off my helmet and intercom, did a backflip out into the night. It was very quiet. 
the only sound being the drumming of aircraft engines in the distance, and no sensation of falling at all. I felt suspended in space, forgetful not getting home were my chief thoughts, and I did think once that it didn't seem very strange to be going to die in a few seconds. None of the parade of my past or anything like that. So out he went, headed from 18,000 feet above the earth to the ground at 120 miles per hour. The werewolf exploded above him, and while he plummeted toward the ground, he lost consciousness during the descent. Which would have been the end of this story. Except three hours later Alchemade, now safely lying on the ground, opened his eyes. He was lying on his back on a pile of snow, and could see the stars above him through the canopy of some pine trees. Slowly and gingerly, Alchemate moved his arms and legs. Remarkably, he seemed unhurt. It seemed that the flexible young pines had slowed his descent, enough that the snow was able to cushion his fall. When he landed in a pile of snow beneath, the impact hadn't been too hard. He had not broken one bone but had only managed to sprain his knee after an 18,000-foot fall from the sky. The first thing he did was to smoke a cigarette and reflect on his good fortune. When he finally stood up, he realized he had sprained his knee and that at some point his boots had come off, presumably in the trees above. Just 20 yards from where he had landed was a wide open area, devoid of snow. If he had landed there, he would have died. Despite being safe and relatively unharmed, Alchemy couldn't walk due to his injured leg. He discarded his unused parachute harness and blew his distress whistle. Soon, some local Germans found him, and he ended up in a hospital where his burns, cuts, and sprain were looked after. He had survived and was remarkably unscathed. Then, the Gestapo arrived. By all rights, Alchemade was a prisoner of war. This would have seen him sent to a prison camp. However, when the Gestapo interrogated him, they asked where his parachute was. He told them he didn't have one. That he had jumped from the plane and been simply lucky. Understandably, the Gestapo didn't believe him. They accused him of burying the parachute and being a spy. If they proved this to be true, it would mean a death sentence for Alchemide. The interrogators kept at it, finding it hard to believe that someone could survive with Alchemade claimed. Nonetheless, he stuck to his story. A search of where he was found led to the Germans finding his discarded harness, which had clearly not been used. To further corroborate his story, the wreckage of the werewolf was found 20 miles away. In the shredded and burned remains of the aircraft, the Gestapo found Alchemate's parachute with the ripcord and cables still wrapped up tight in the container. Finally, they were convinced. He skirted death twice to now become a prisoner of war. The Germans were impressed and even gave him a commemorative certificate that stated Alchemate had indeed fallen 18,000 feet without a parachute. And survived. He was sent to Stalag Luft III, a POW camp in Poland. Nicholas Alchemate's story gave him celebrity status. He received extra cigarette rations, and another prisoner, Flight Lieutenant Bennett Kenyon Kenyon, even drew a portrait of him. The war was coming to an end, and the Russians were advancing. To keep prisoners of war away from. The Russians, which would have led to the prisoners being liberated, tens of thousands of POWs including Alchemate, were forced to march west. They faced blizzards, exhaustion, and starvation. Tragically, hundreds died before they were eventually freed, and the war came to a close. Alchemate had survived. He danced on the edges of death more times than most, if not all human beings do in their lifetimes. After the war, Nicholas Stephen Alchemate moved to Loboro with his wife and children, he lived a good life and passed away in 1987. So was it luck? What are these forces that seem to guide our lives so much? How can one man die from the height of 30 feet while another lives after falling from over 18,000 feet without a parachute? The debate has raged on since Alchemade first stood up after his famous fall, fueled by each variable no matter how small it seems. Everything from the depth of the snow to the type of the pine tree he fell into has been scrutinized. 
and the only ultimate conclusion we can come to is that his survival is simply unexplainable. History has told us a great many tales of unexplained possessions. These tales are the whispers of religions, of the old or the fearful. They vary by region, by demon, and most of them are unsolved, untouched, or even kept secret. Those curious enough to dig in further have been cautioned, been told to tread lightly into this world of paranormal phenomena. Many have turned away, urging only those brave enough to go forth and face what they call the curse of the exorcism. Exorcism, from the Greek, Escherasmus, binding by oath, is the religious or spiritual practice of evicting demons or other spiritual entities from a person or an area that is believed to be possessed. As citizens of the world, we go back and forth on what is truth and what is fiction. Is it true that a demon can bewitch and control the human body so much so that the bewitched body can lose all authority and be a victim to unpredictable actions and harsh words? Or is this simply an undiagnosed psychological disorder, as science tells us it must be? Experts in exorcism, preachers, religious leaders, historians believe that the possessed persons are the victims not the perpetrators of evil doings. They are not regarded as evil in themselves, nor wholly responsible for their actions. Because of this, those that specialize in performing the exorcisms, which is the act of expelling a demon or evil spirit from the body, regard exorcism as more of a cure than a punishment. For some of the possessed, exorcism has been the cure that brought the person back into their own body again. Unfortunately, some victims of demonic possession don't survive this cure. Some never again return to their body. Annelise Michel grew up devoutly Catholic in Bavaria, West Germany, in the 1960s, where she attended Mass twice a week. When she was 16 years old, she suddenly blacked out at school and began walking around dazed. Though Annelise did not remember the event, her friends and family said she was in a trance-like state. Eight years later, on July 1, 1976, 23-year-old Annelies Michelle died after almost nine months of exorcism. She spent eight years seeking help for her shaking in trance-like states, to no real avail. A year after the original incident, she experienced another one, this time in her sleep. She was finally diagnosed with grand mal epilepsy. After her diagnosis, she changed a lot and spent more of her time depressed. After a long stay at the hospital and receiving medical care for her new condition, Annalise thought that everything would be back to normal, but it wasn't. She began to see things out of the ordinary, out of her own reality, starting with devilish grimaces across people's faces during her daily prayers. She called them devil faces. It's at that point in time that she was believed to be possessed. She continued to take these hallucinations to her medical professionals but received nothing to make them go away. She was unable to find any reason and explanation why she was seeing the devil faces. Things only got worse from there. As the days passed, she began to hear voices following her, telling her she would rot in hell. She sunk deeper into her depression. She felt hopeless, alone. Doctors found seemingly no reason for what was happening. They couldn't help her condition at all. She was initially hesitant to open up to doctors about these demons, afraid they wouldn't believe her. And one time, she did tell a doctor about the demons. They reacted as much as she expected. Desperate for help for Annalise, her parents finally noticed that perhaps Annalise needed a different kind of help. One that existed outside the medical community. They feared their daughter might be possessed. They sought aid from many pastors in the community begging for an exorcism. Unfortunately, all of the Catholic chaplains rejected them and recommended they continue the medication for the proof of a possession. Possession or infestation, as they sometimes called it, is strictly structured. There are set criteria to fulfill before any bishop can approve an exorcism. Pastor Ernst Alt supervising Annalise at that time asked the Bishop of Würzburg for the permit to perform an exorcism on Annalise Michel in 1974. His request was also rejected. So he recommended Annalise abide by an even more religious lifestyle. 
According to an article in ComingSoon.net, the attacks did not disappear, and she became more terrible at her parents' house in Klinienburg. She often insulted, beat, and bit the family members. She didn't eat because the demons didn't allow her to. Annalise slept on the stone floor, surrounded by spiders, flies, and coal. After an exact verification in September 1975, Joseph Stungel, the Bishop of Warsburg, assigned Father Arnold Rents and Pastor Ernst Alp with the order to perform the great exorcism on Annalise Michel. The basis for this ritual is the Ritual Romanum, a still valid canon law from the 17th century. Pastor Alt and Father Rents tried to save Annalise from over six individuals, Lucifer, Judith Iscariot, Nero, Cain, Hitler, and Fleischmann. From September 1975 till July 1976, they held one to two sessions a week. Her attacks were so strong that she sometimes had to be held down by three men, or even worse, they would have to chain her up. Between those sessions in her parents' house, Annalise went some time without any attacks, at which she was able to go to school and take her final examinations at the Pedagogy Academy in Warsburg. She even went to church. She experienced some semblance of normalcy, like it was before. The exorcism continues over weeks and months, always praying the same specified prayers and incantations over and over again. As expected, the ritual was thought to be working, but the attacks didn't stop. The young woman grows unconscious and paralyzed more often. Sometimes her parents are present or her sisters, even a married couple that claims to have discovered Annalise. Over several weeks, she denies every food. Her knees are burst because of the 600 genuflections she does obsessively during the exorcisms. During the course of the exorcism, they logged over 400 audio tapes to document their findings. The last day of the exorcism rite was June 30, 1976. Annalise can't wave during the genuflections because she is now suffering from pneumonia, totally emaciated, and has a high temperature. Her parents even help her do them, begging for absolution. Is the last sentence Annalise says to the exorcist. To her mother, she says, Mother, I'm afraid. Anna Michelle recorded the death of her daughter the very next day, July 1st, 1976. At noon, Pastor Ernst Alt informs the prosecuting authorities in Aft Schaffenberg. The senior prosecutor began investigating immediately. There were only two questions to answer. What caused the death of Annalise Michel? And who was responsible? The cause of death, as diagnosed by forensics, Annalise starved to death. If the accused would have begun force-feeding one week before her death, Annalise could have been saved. Her sister told the courts that Annalise didn't want to go to a mental house or nor by sedated and forced to eat. The exorcist tried to prove the presence of demons by playing the over 40 tapes they recorded. There were such strange dialogues, like two of the demons arguing, each arguing over who of them has to leave Annalise's body first. A commission of the German Bishop Conference later declared that Annalise Michel was not possessed. Annalise's parents and the chaplains were all found guilty of manslaughter and the omission of first aid. The judgment was not as harsh as expected. All of the accused were sentenced to six months of probation. You're walking as you breathe in the fresh air of the field surrounding you. The sun is shining. The birds are singing. And the sky is as blue as the ocean. You lean back to sit down. But instead of being softly greeted by the grass of the meadow, you realize that you're falling. You panic, trying to reach for something, but around you, there is nothing. Just as you feel as you're going to hit the ground, you wake up. You're panting, dripping with sweat. It was just a dream, you think, as you release the tension and lean back in your bed. Decoding the mystery of dreams is not a mark of the modern day, but a practice thousands of years old from both scientists and people alike. As humans, we are continually questioning the meaning behind our dreams. Why do some people have more dreams than others? What do dreams about the future mean? And why do they sometimes come true? The science of dreams varies across the globe. 
Each society's predominant understanding of the dream world depends upon the culture and the history of each part of the world. Each place has different legends about the nature and origins of dreams. Ancient Greeks and Romans believed that dreams provided messages from the gods. The Chinese believed that dreams were a message from our dead ancestors, and many Native American tribes, as well as Mexican civilizations, believed dreams were a different world we visit when we sleep. A Parallel Universe Building on the understanding of dreams from Native Americans, we examine the question, even the possibility that some of our dreams may actually be a form of reality, happening in a parallel universe, right then and there. Is it possible that some of our dreams are, in fact, glimpses of events taking place in an alternate reality? As humans, we are programmed to dream. The word dream comes from an old word in English that means joy and music. The average human has approximately 6 to 10 dreams each night. A majority of these dreams take place during the REM portion of our sleep cycle. Despite having such active minds while at rest, traveling to new places, or revisiting old ones, our dreams are usually forgotten mere minutes after we wake up. However, what if there's an actual meaning to dreams that would make them more lucrative to remember? Have you ever experienced a dream that was so real and lifelike that you felt you were literally there in the moment? A dream that was, for that moment, reality. A warm breeze on your face. The smell of the vast ocean right in front of you. The taste of salt left on your lips after a swim. Warm sand squishing beneath your feet. These realistic dreams feel much more than just the creation of our imagination. A new science-based theory might actually reveal this to be true. Scientists of today have found themselves agreeing with Native American tribes and Mexican nations in their belief that we, while namely our brains, visit a parallel universe when we dream. This would explain why humans can dream in color and can utilize all five senses to feel what's happening within the dream. The theory of a parallel universe all starts with the existence of a multiverse. The idea that our universe isn't the only one out there. In fact, it is just one of many. Within each of these universes is a new reality. It's one that may closely resemble our own but is altered in some way by the decisions that we've made. This is a concept that scientists have entertained and explored for many years, even though it can be a slightly controversial belief within the scientific community. For a moment, consider the last major decision you made in your life. Perhaps you moved to a new city for your dream job. In one of these parallel universes, another version of you may exist that shows differently. Choosing instead to stay in the city you know and turn down the job. This one change in your narrative creates a ripple effect, changing every area of your life from that moment on. If you have ever dreamt of your life, but it appeared to you as a lightly altered or skewed version of reality, maybe your home was different, or your town had changed. Maybe you had a different career or even a different partner. What may have actually happened? In that moment was a glimpse at your life inside a parallel universe. The dream itself feels so real, as if you're actually standing there because it is, in fact, real, just in an alternate universe. This is the life that the alternate you has created. People often have a recurring dream about a place they never visited or never even heard of. It's possible that such dreams are glimpses into what one experienced in a parallel universe. Sometimes people dream about events that have not yet happened but will take place in the future. Such dreams could also be incoming images from an alternate world, where you are living a different life. Who knows? Perhaps some of our most special dreams are a window into a parallel universe. This is, of course, pure speculation, but without speculation and scientific curiosity, we will never be able to learn more about the secrets of the universe and our reality. So can some of our dreams be glimpses of events taking place in an alternate reality, a parallel universe? This begs the question, one that scientists and many others contemplate. If our dreams are, in fact, a glimpse into an alternate life, can we use them to explore these worlds? Are we no longer limited to just our universe? We only know one thing for sure, much further study is required, 
but this just may be the start of some incredible discoveries in the future. There are tons of mysterious places around the world, both on land and in water that are difficult to explain logically. The legends of missing vessels and ghost ships drifting without their crew in these locations have made them synonymous with mystery. Though the notorious Bermuda Triangle tops the list of the most mysterious places on this planet, a number of other locations also remain mysterious, as much as the former. The Devil's Sea, also known as the Dragon's Triangle, is one such sailor's nightmare in the waters around the world. The Dragon's Triangle is an area of Japan that bears a resemblance to the phenomena of the Bermuda Triangle. For centuries, Japanese fishermen have been lost to the waters of Minami, the Devil's Sea. More recently, scores of modern ships and aircraft have inexplicably fallen victim to these unforgiving waters too, some disappearing without a trace. Sailors have reported countless numbers of fishing boats disappearing within the Devil's Sea limits. Legend has it that dragons rise to the surface of the water to drag boats and their crew members into the deep seabed. The man who first put forth the idea of the Bermuda Triangle, Charles Berlitz, is also the one who proposed the notion of the Devil's Sea in Japan. Berlitz labeled it the Dragon's Triangle in his book, The Dragon's Triangle, published in 1989. According to Berlitz, between 1952 and 1954, five Japanese military ships and 700 crewmen disappeared in this mysterious triangle. The Devil's Sea is part of the Philippine Sea, following an imaginary line from western Japan north of Tokyo to the tip of the Pacific and returning east through the Agasawara Islands and Guam to Japan again. Like Bermuda, it also forms a similar triangular-shaped zone, starting from western Japan, north of Tokyo, following a line to the point in the Pacific at about 145 degrees east latitude. Both are located at 35 degrees west latitude, respectively. The similarities do not end here. The two zones are in the eastern end of the mainland and stretch to the deepest parts of waters where the sea is driven by strong currents over active underwater volcanic areas. The Dragon's Triangle is an area of great seismic activity with a seabed in which the transformation continues, and some parts of the land emerge to 12,000 meters deep. Those islets and masses of land had emerged and disappeared before they could be drawn on maps. There are navigational letters and documents that included a few of those vanished lands in which many experienced sailors used to land in ancient times. It is said that the conqueror Kublai Khan, the fifth great Khan of the Mongol Empire, and the grandson of Genghis Khan, had tried to make inroads into Japan in 1274 and 1281 AD. Khan attempted the invasions through a route that crossed the Devil Sea. He failed to invade the country after losing his vessels and 40,000 crew members abroad in this triangular area, reportedly due to typhoons. There were two typhoons that mysteriously protected the shores of Japan from the Mongol hordes. The Japanese legend conveys that kamikaze or divine winds were called upon by the Emperor of Japan. These winds turned into two dreadful storms over the Devil Sea that sank a fleet of 900 Mongolian ships carrying 40,000 soldiers. Then, the devastated fleet had left from mainland China, and it was supposed to meet a southern fleet of 100,000 troops to overwhelm Japanese defenders. Instead, Kublai Khan's forces fought to a stalemate after 50 days, and the Japanese repelled the invaders when Khan's forces retreated and many soldiers deserted. The famous Japanese legend of Atsurobun, which literally means a hollow ship in Japanese, refers to an unknown object that allegedly washed ashore in 1803. In Hitachi province, on the eastern coast of Japan, close to Tokyo and the Dragon's Triangle. According to legend, an attractive young woman aged 18 to 20 years old arrived on a local beach aboard the hollow ship on February 22, 1803. Fishermen brought her inland to investigate further, but the woman was unable to communicate in Japanese. She was very different from anyone there. The woman had red hair and eyebrows, and her hair was elongated by artificial white extensions. The extensions could have been made of white fur or thin white powder textile streaks. 
This hairstyle cannot be found in any literature. The skin of the lady was a very pale, pinkish color. She wore precious long and smooth clothes of unknown fabrics. Although the mysterious woman appeared friendly and courteous, she acted oddly. She always clutched a moderately sized 24-inch quadratic box, made of pale material. She did not allow anyone to touch the box no matter how kindly or pressingly the witnesses asked. Unable to communicate with one another nor gain any helpful information, the fisherman returned her and her vessel to the sea where it drifted away. Many believe that she was an intelligent extraterrestrial being who had accidentally come to Earth from another world through her spaceship. That said, the credibility of the books containing accounts of the mystery woman has been questioned by many historians. Though it has been verified that these books were written before 1844, well before the modern era of the UFO. For thousands of years, the inhabitants of the area have described the Dragon's Triangle as an extremely dangerous place because there have been several strange disappearances and bizarre events that are still unexplained. Among its victims, a long list of fishing boats, large warships, and aircraft have simply disappeared with all their crew inside the evil triangle, with every last radio communication going unanswered. One would think that it is spatial-temporal distensions and deviations of crew members' consciousness that prevent communication. It has been verified that the magnetic activity of the zone is also similar to the Bermuda Triangle, which is greater than any other place on Earth. However, no one has still been able to determine whether this unusual magnetic activity is the actual cause of the disappearances or not. Departing from the magnetic theory, Old folklore speaks of the dragon that appears from the depths to swallow a whole ship or even an island. Dragons that then return to the bottom of the sea, without a trace. According to another Japanese legend, the dragon's triangle boasts the sea devil, in its deepest part where it has an ancient city frozen in time forever. People also claim to have witnessed phantom ships suddenly appear as if they ascend from the depths to disappear after a while. The Dragon's Triangle became the center of the world's research and naval interests when warships, fishing boats, and aircraft were all revoked from their regular route through the Devil's Sea Zone. In 1955, the Japanese government financed the research ship, the Keomaru 5, to study the Devil's Sea. The boat mysteriously disappeared with all of the scientists who were integrating the expedition, forcing the Japanese government to officially label the area as a dangerous zone. Besides all the unnatural deaths and disappearances, there are reports of UFO sightings and the mystical thick fog that looms large in this area of the Pacific, appearing and disappearing mysteriously. Just like the Bermuda Triangle, the activities of extraterrestrial vessels can be experienced there frequently. For the past few decades, people from all around the world have been trying their best to explain the strange phenomena that have taken place for millennia. However, there are really some fascinating facts and theories about the Dragon's Triangle that you should know about. One theory tends to a strange connection between the magnetic poles of the two triangles, the Bermuda and the Dragon Triangle, that creates a spatio-temporal duplicate of each other. Mystery lovers claim that the Bermuda and Dragon's Triangles are at the opposite side of each other, and that a straight line could be easily drawn between them through the center of the Earth. Even if it were true, it would not explain the dangers inherent in any of the zones. However, the reality is that there are mainly these two areas on Earth where huge ships and aircraft inexplicably disappear with all its crew without leaving a trace or signs of life. Scientists specializing in different subjects, geologists, meteorologists, physicists, and astronomers have proposed another explanation for the Dragon's Triangle Mysteries. According to them, there are 12 zones of great geomagnetic disturbances on the planet. Two of them are the North and South Poles, and five of the remaining ten are closely linked to the Dragon Triangle Zone. That's how the place shows such unusual geomagnetic disturbances. These disturbances distract aircraft and ships. Another truly engrossing cutting-edge hypothesis comes from the existence of the parallel universe. According to this theory, there is indeed a huge vortex in the Dragon's Triangle or any such other spots that opens to another world, a parallel world consisting of antimatter, 
which absorbs people, masses, or even light and time. At the origin of the universe, matter was not alone to appear. Antimatter accompanied it in equal quantities. Thus, matter and antimatter separately form two distinct universes, a universe of matter and a universe of antimatter. These two universes coexist within the same space but not within the same time. Time separates them. It is this temporal difference that forms a barrier between them and prevents them from mixing. If this were not the case, matter and antimatter would totally destroy themselves on contact with each other. This separation is therefore essential. These universes have evolved at the same pace in the same stages and have both populated the same galaxies composed of stars and planets. Though these galaxies are non-distributed differently in space from one universe to another. In other words, galaxies and anti-galaxies occupy different places in space. Each star and planet in each matter universe galaxy has a twin in another antimatter universe galaxy. Our world is no exception. The Earth has a twin Earth of antimatter called the Dark Twin. An anti-Earth that vibrates at a frequency higher than that of the Earth because it is more evolved than it. Each star and planet in the universe of matter is connected to its antimatter twin by an energy bridge, a magnetic vortex. Among the various hypotheses put forward, the most plausible is the Atlantic hypothesis. Indeed, the destruction of Poseidia, the largest and the last of the seven islands that formed Atlantis, left at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean a giant crystal emitting powerful electromagnetic radiation that fed the Atlanticians with energy. It would be this huge crystal, always active, that would disturb the magnetic vortex connecting the Earth to its twin antimatter. Its hyper-powerful radiation would cross the Earth from side to side and connect the Bermuda Triangle to the Dragon's Triangle in a huge energy loop whose radium fluctuations would occasionally open a vortex, the spatial-temporal door to the Earth's dark twin. In 1986, while looking for a suitable place to observe the sharks, Kaichiro Aratake, a director of Anagunichar Tourism Association, noticed some singular seabed formations resembling architectural structures. The strange structures are now widely known as Yanagian Monument, or the Yanagian Submarine Ruins. It is a submerged rock formation off the coast of Yanagini Island, the southernmost of the Ryoku Islands in Japan. It lies approximately 100 kilometers east of Taiwan. To make things even stranger, the Yanaguni Monument is situated within the Devil Sea Triangle, which has led many to believe that the underwater structures are the remains of the lost city of Atlantis. It is true that with this one single video, we can't draw a proper conclusion to all those strange things that have been occurring in the Devil Sea for more than a thousand years. The truth is that it's still unknown to us what really happens in the Devil Sea. Scientists have concluded all these oddities saying that the disappearances are due to the fact that this place has intense magnetic alterations, which cause aircraft and ships to become disoriented when entering the triangle. However, what really happens there is still an unsolved mystery. You probably already know the Disney version of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. But did you know that the original 812 version written by the Grimm brothers and published in a collection of fairy tales is a much, much darker story? It's thought that the story itself is even older than the Grimm's version and has been passed down through generations since the Middle Ages, along with many similar European folktales. The Disney version is definitely more palatable than older versions, which may not be suitable for kids. You know the story. An innocent young woman who lost her mother is banished by her cruel narcissistic stepmother who is too jealous to share a home with her. But rather than languishing in the woods, Snow White is found and helped by the seven dwarves. And eventually, she finds her true love, who saves her from the spell her evil stepmother cast. Countless Halloween costumes later, and the story is still a classic. The hauntingly older story, by contrast, casts Snow White's actual mother in the role of the jealous parent who sends her away when she's only seven years old and claims to want to kill the little girl so she can eat her liver with salt and pepper. Here's what she says to the huntsman who is tasked with murdering her daughter. Kill her. And as proof that she is dead, 
bring her lungs and liver back to me. Similarly to the Disney version, he kills a boar instead and brings back the animal's lungs and liver for the queen to feast upon, believing them to belong to Snow White. But that's not even the most disturbing part of the original story. Remember how the prince eventually comes to find Snow White lying in a glass coffin in a poisoned slumber after eating an apple, from which he wakes her with a kiss? Well, in the original story it's not the kiss of true love that awakens the sleeping princess, but rather her servants tugging her away to keep her away from a necrophiliac prince who is lusting for the girl's corpse. The end of the story is slightly redeeming as the evil queen dies at the hands of Snow White and the prince, who force her to wear red-hot iron shoes at their wedding, making her dance in them until she falls dead from exhaustion. Here's the quote from the Grimm Brothers' tale. They put a pair of iron shoes into burning coals. They were brought forth with tongs and placed before her. She was forced to step into the red-hot shoes and dance until she fell down dead. I'm sure you can agree with Disney's decision to tone things down a bit for their fairy princess version of the story. But things start to get really interesting around 1994, when a German historian named Ecker Sonder published, Schneevi Weizen, March and Older Vahidi. Snow White, is it a fairy tale? In it, he claimed that he'd discovered an even older and true story that may have inspired the Grimm Brothers' version. According to Sonder, Snow White was actually Margaret V. von Waldeck, a German countess born in 1533 to Philip IV and his first wife. When her father remarried Katerina of Hatzfeld, she was sent away to Wildingen in Brussels by her new stepmother. It is said that she fell in love with a prince who would someday become Philip II of Spain. But their relationship was not endorsed by his father and stepmother. In fact, their relationship was politically inconvenient at the time, and she was allegedly poisoned and died at the age of 21. There is evidence that at the time, the possible murderer was, in fact, the King of Spain, who was adamantly opposed to the love between his son and Margarita and sent a Spanish assassin to kill her. So what about those seven dwarves? Philip IV owned several copper mines that employed children basically as slaves. These were not only forced to work in inhuman conditions, causing many to die at a young age, but those who survived had severely stunted growth and deformed limbs from malnutrition and the hard physical labor. As a result, they were often referred to as the poor dwarfs. The poison apple, again, according to the writer, is attributable to the historic event that happened in Germany which saw an elderly man arrested for giving poisoned apples to children who he believed were stealing his fruit. However, not everyone agrees with the version told by Sander. According to a group of scholars from Laura Bovaria, Snow White is inspired by the life of Maria Sophia von Erdel born on June 15, 1725, in Laura, Maine in the same region. The girl was the daughter of a landowner, Prince Philip Christoph von Erdel, and his wife, Baroness von Bettendorf. After the Baroness's death, Prince Philip went on to marry Claudia, Elizabeth Maria von Veningen, Countess of Reichen, who was set to dislike her stepchildren, and she preferred legitimate children instead. The castle where they lived, which is now a museum, housed a famous talking mirror, an acoustic toy capable of recording and reproducing the voice of the speaker. Now housed in the special museum, the mirror constructed in 1720 by the mirror manufacturer of the electorate of Mainz and Lore had been in the house during the time that Maria's stepmother lived there, and was a gift from the prince to his second wife. The dwarves in Maria's story are also linked to a mining town, Bieber, located west of Laurel and hidden among seven mountains. The smallest tunnels could only be accessed by very short miners who often wore bright hoods as the door have frequently been depicted over the years. Laura's study group claims that the glass coffin can be connected to the region's famous glassworks, while the poison apple can be associated with the deadly nightshade poison that grows abundantly near the castle. Eventually, Maria Sophie, Sophia Margarita's stepmother forced the girl to flee the house, effectively making her a vagabond. The girl lived a few years in the woods adjacent to the mansion, helped by the small miners who worked in the mines of her father, and finally dying of smallpox. 
the aversion to the young girl by the perfidious Claudia, Elizabeth Maria von Veningen, made her a martyr, dead from the hatred that the woman felt towards her beauty. It may never be known where the story of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves truly originated, but the fairy tale is certainly inspired by some real events that occurred in Germany in the centuries preceding its drafting. In any case, the Seven Dwarves are identified almost with certainty as the small workers of the German mines of the 17th and 18th centuries. And the story could be the result of a mixture of elements, legends, and events that really occurred mixed in with fantasy and imagination. It was a year into the American Civil War in the spring of 1862 when Major General Ulysses S. Grant camped at Pittsburgh Landing near Shiloh, Tennessee. He had pushed his troops into Confederate territory and was anxiously awaiting Major General Don Carlos Buell's troops who were due to meet up with his. However, before the two armies could unite, a band of Confederate troops from nearby Current, Mississippi attacked the Union Army early in the morning on April 6 in the hopes of defeating the General's troops before they grew in size. Grant's army, including some who had recently arrived from Ohio, held off the advancing Confederate and established an artillery line. The fighting went well into the night, and by sunrise the next day, the rest of the expected soldiers had arrived. The Confederates were now outnumbered by nearly 10,000 men, and they were forced back. Even after mounting a counterattack, the Union Army was able to push the Confederates back more easily. The Battle of Shiloh saw more than 3,000 dead and over 16,000 wounded. Neither side was prepared for so much damage, and the fighting set each back considerably. Common in this era were wounds from bullets and bayonets, which often led to infections. Even in cooler months, these wounds were easily contaminated by dirt or shrapnel, creating welcome environments for bacteria, which would set in and begin to feed on the soldiers' injuries. Due to the hard conditions of constant marching and limited food rations on the battlefront, many of the soldiers were already experiencing suppressed immune systems, which left them vulnerable to infection at higher rates than normal. Despite their best efforts, army doctors were unable to prevent such infections. At this point in medical history, we still didn't understand the concept of microorganisms well, and germ theory was still yet to be discovered. As a result, countless soldiers died from infections that today would be very easy to prevent or treat quickly. In Shiloh, some soldiers had to wait in the mud for two days and nights of rain for the medics to have time to see them. Around dusk on the first night, some of the wounded men noticed an eerie sight. Their wounds appeared to glow in the dark, throwing strange light onto the battlefield around them. Something even more disturbing. After soldiers had been removed from the battlefield to be treated, those with wounds that had glowed turned out to survive at higher rates and experienced faster healing than those whose wounds hadn't. This mysterious light that appeared to bestow healing energies came to be called Angel's Glow. In 2001, almost 140 years after the battle, 17-year-old Bill Martin was visiting the Shiloh battlefield with his family when he heard about the glowing wounds. He asked his mom, a microbiologist at the USDA Agricultural Research Service who had studied luminescent bacteria that lived in soil, about it. So, you know, he comes home and mom, you're working with glowing bacteria. Could that have caused the glowing wounds? Martin told Science Net Links. And so being a scientist, of course, I said, well, you can do an experiment to find out. And that's just what Bill did. He and his 18-year-old friend, John Curtis, did the research for their science project and proposed that a bacteria called Photorhabdus luminescens could be responsible for the angel's glow phenomenon. These bacteria are luminescent and could only live in cold and humid environments. The battle was fought in early April when temperatures were low, and the grounds were wet with rain. The injured soldiers were left to the elements of nature and suffered from hypothermia. This would provide a perfect environment for P. Luminescence to overtake and kill off harmful bacteria, avoiding possible infections. Later in the hospital, under warmer conditions, these bacteria died, leaving the wound totally clean. Often. 
A bacterial infection in an open wound would herald a fatal outcome. But this was an instance where the right bacterium at the right time was actually instrumental in saving lives. So the soldiers at Shiloh should have been thanking their microbial buddies. But who knew back then that angels came in microscopic sizes? As for Martin and Curtis, they went on to win first place in the team competition at the 2001 Intel International Science and Engineering Fair. On a shelf in the foyer of the Clarendon Laboratory of Oxford University stands a bell that has been ringing for nearly 179 years and has rung more than 10 million times. Its story began in the 1780s when Italian physicist Luigi Galvani discovered bioelectricity by accident. Galvani was in the process of dissecting a frog when he noticed something strange. Any time he touched the frog's nerves with one of the metal tools he was using in the dissection, the frog's legs flexed, as though it was still alive. His first hypothesis was that the movement was caused by some vital fluid which was based on a biological assumption that's no longer accepted in the field. Later, he revised his theory about the phenomenon, stating that he must have been witnessing some kind of animal electricity. Another physicist, Alessandro Volta, suggested that both of these theories were wrong and put forward one of his own. He supposed that the dead animal's nerve acted as an electrolyte, and the electricity was generated due to the different types of materials that were being used. Volta later proved this theory when he created the world's first battery in 1800. The voltaic pile or dry pile was created when several discs of copper or silver and zinc were sandwiched together, soaked in brine, and stacked with cardboard discs. This invention disproved a theory that electricity could only be generated by a living being. Unfortunately, the original voltaic battery was dangerous to handle because sulfuric acid was used in the brine and the power only lasted an hour or two. Then along came Giuseppe Zamboni, another Italian physicist, who perfected the idea using the voltaic pile. His two-sided Zamboni pile used paper discs coated with zinc foil on one side and manganese dioxide on the other, allowing the moisture from the discs to behave as the electrolyte. The Zamboni pile was capable of creating something called an electrostatic clock by connecting the two ends of the pile close together while keeping a metal ball suspended between the two terminal ends. The Oxford Bell is set up just this way. In 1825, Watkins and Hill, a London-based instrument maker, created a battery to power the electric bell. Even though it was created a mere 25 years after Volta's invention, for some reason, this battery has outlived every battery made since then. It currently holds the Guinness World Record for the most durable battery. The bell was brought to Oxford University in 1840 by Reverend Robert Walker. The bell setup consists of a spherical metal clapper that oscillates between two small bells. The metal clapper is approximately 4 mm in diameter, powered by the battery placed above the bells. The battery is believed to be a dry pile battery with a paste inside it. This paste contains the minimum amount of water required for the electrolyte to work. A coating of solid sulfur keeps the water inside and helps avoid any leakages. Beyond this, we don't really know what materials or components are inside the body of the battery. Now, coming to the most important question, how has such an old battery lasted for so long? Since we don't know about the exact interior of the Oxford Electric Bell, there's only one way for us to answer this question. We must do what scientists always seem to be doing, assuming. By looking at battery diagrams from around the same time that this one was constructed back in the 1820s, the battery can be assumed to be a Zamboni pile with around 2,000 or more discs composed of zinc and magnesium dioxide. All 2,000 discs would be stacked one on top of the other, creating a massive voltage of approximately 2 kilovolts between the two bells. Mind you, that's 16 times greater than America's main supply voltage. But the metal clapper takes only 1 nanoamp of current each time it rings. This tiny current requirement of the clapper and the massive amount of available voltage is probably why the Oxford Electric Bell is still ringing. In the 179 years since its inception, the bell has rung more than 10 billion times. 
To know exactly what the battery is made of, we would have to cut it open and end the bell's 179-year long run. But opening the apparatus would also ruin the experiment and prevent us from seeing how much longer it would last. The bell has now been placed between two panes of glass to dampen its continuous ringing. How long will the Oxford Electric Bell continue ringing, and what is the battery inside made of? These are two of the most burning questions in the scientific community. People believe that the bell will eventually stop when the clapper breaks because of wear and tear throughout its prolonged lifetime. In 1841, just a year after being set up, Watkins and Hill wrote in a letter, the residual electric power sufficient to keep up the ringing of the bell seldom lasts for longer than three or four years. It's a pretty apparatus, but also transient in its working process. They would have been proud to learn just how wrong they were, and I'm sure they're smiling down from the stars with pride to hear their bell still ringing in all its glory. Deep in the jungles of South America, mysterious beings lurk, and humans have been telling stories about them for generations. Varying in size from quite small to larger than a man, tales of these creatures typically include some common factors. First, the beings are hairy. Next, they seem to have their own culture and society, living in villages together. And finally, they appear to have their own language of whistles that they use to communicate. Depending on where the stories originate, the names for these creatures vary but the most common name is Marikoshi. We can understand the Marikoshi to be what we call Bigfoot. One of the most famous encounters between a human and a Marikoshi was British Colonel Percival H. Fawcett, who disappeared suddenly deep in the jungle while on an expedition to search for the lost city of Z. Before he disappeared, however, he kept copious and detailed notes of his explorations, which his son Brian would subsequently publish as a series of books. A compelling story from one of those books called Lost Trails Lost Cities is about Fawcett's brush with the Marikoshi. The year was 1914, and Fawcett was exploring an area called Mato Grosso, an uncharted region in the southwest. Beginning in Bolivia, the expedition traveled up the Guapo River towards the dark jungle interior. By this time, They'd already been well acquainted with stories told by locals of hairy, man-like beasts who lurked in the jungle. It was easy to dismiss such stories as fantastic, but they also took note and remained vigilant of their surroundings. One of Fawcett's companions on the journey, Ivan Sanderson, wrote the following. These creatures were apparently called Marikoshis by the Maxibis. They dwelt to their northeast. Due east, there was said to be another group of short black people covered with hair who were truly cannibalistic and hunted humans for food, cooking the bodies over a fire on a bamboo spit and tearing off the meat. These, the Maxibus regarded as merely loathsome and lowly people. On another expedition, Fawcett learned of a race of eight people who lived in burrows underground and were nocturnal. Locals called them Morcagos or Bat People because of their nighttime haunting. They were also called caballeros, or hairy people, by the Spanish-speaking, and tattoos, or armadillos, by indigenous groups named for their burrowing lifestyle. Fawcett also reported that these beings possessed superhuman senses of smell, allowing them to be particularly acute hunters. Despite these unsettling claims, the expedition ventured out along the river and stumbled on some strange things right away. First, they discovered a previously uncontacted indigenous tribe called the Maxibus. Their behavior was immediately very strange to the travelers as they worshipped the sun and demonstrated sophisticated knowledge of the solar system, which they were able to reproduce in impressive detail. The tribe merited future study, but the expedition needed to move on. They were not anthropologists and had ventured into the jungle with another agenda that they needed to return to. After staying with the Maxibus tribe for a few days, they pushed on, deeper into uncharted territory where outsiders had never been. Several more days passed before the group discovered a trailhead in the jungle, which they assumed had been created and used by one of the tribes of the area. Having paused to discuss whether or not to follow the trail, the expedition was suddenly hushed as they watched two figures passing nearly a hundred yards away. 
Speaking in an unidentifiable language and carrying bows and arrows, the figures appear normal at first, likely members of one of the local indigenous groups. But when the explorers looked more closely, they saw something incredible. Here's what Fawcett wrote about the encounter. We could not see them clearly for the shadows dappling their bodies, but it seemed to me they were large hairy men, with exceptionally long arms, and with foreheads sloping back from pronounced irises, men of a very primitive kind. In fact, stark naked. Suddenly, they turned and made off into the undergrowth, and we, knowing it was useless to follow, started up the north leg of the trail. The way that Fawcett describes this pair of beings he encountered in the jungle, it's clear that he's not talking about normal humans. But things were about to get even more strange as night fell. When instead of the chirping of insects, the night air filled with the bizarre sounds of horns blowing, as though as a warning. From Fawcett's journal again, in the subdued light of evening, beneath the high vault of branches in this foreign, untreated forest by civilized men. The sound was as eerie as the opening notes of some fantastic opera. We knew the savages made it, and that those savages were now on our trail. Soon, we could hear shouts and jabbering to the accompaniment of the rough horn calls, a barbarous, merciless den, in marked contrast to the stealth of the ordinary savage. Darkness still distant above the treetops was settling rapidly down here in the depths of the wood. So we looked about us for a camping site, which offered some measure of safety from attack, and finally took refuge in a Takwara thicket. Here, the naked savages would not dare to follow cause of the wicked inch-long thorns. As we slung our hammocks inside the natural stockade, we could hear the savages jabbering excitedly all around but not daring to enter. Then as the last light went, they left us, and we heard no more of them. The idea is chilling, being surrounded completely by unseen, unknown beings, and knowing that you are the trespasser. Particularly unsettling is the aggression inherent in the sound of the mysterious horns, circling and pressing in on the expedition party, unrelenting until dawn. What's even stranger is that by the next morning, there was no sign of these lurking antagonizers, and the camp was cleared in the eerie silence, and the group moved on. They continued to follow one of the many well-worn trails they found in the jungle, which eventually led them to a village that seemed to be the home of the strange tribe they'd witnessed earlier. The village was definitely populated, but the inhabitants didn't seem quite human. Here, in Fawcett's own words, In the morning, we went on, and within a quarter of a mile came to a sort of palm-leaf century box, then another. Then all of a sudden, we reached open forest. The undergrowth fell away, Disclosing between the tree boles a village of primitive shelters, were squatted some of the most villainous savages I've ever seen. Some were engaged in making arrows, others just idled, great ape-like brutes who looked as if they had scarcely evolved beyond the level of beasts. I whistled, and an enormous creature, hairy as a dog, leaped to his feet in the nearest shelter, fitted an arrow to his bow in a flash and came up dancing from one leg to the other till he was only four yards away, emitting grunts that sounded like ugh, ugh, ugh. He remained there dancing, and suddenly, the whole forest around us was alive with these hideous eight men, all grunting, ugh, 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 and dancing from leg to leg in the same way as the strong arrows to their bows. It looked like a very delicate situation for us, and I wondered if it was the end. I made friendly overtures in Maxibi, but they paid no attention. It was as though human speech were beyond their powers of comprehension. The creature in front of me seized his dance, stood for a moment perfectly still, and then drew his bowstring back till it was level with his ear, at the same time raising the barbed point of the six-foot arrow to the height of my chest. I looked straight into the pig-like eyes half-hidden under the overhanging brows and knew that he was not going to lose that arrow yet. As deliberately as he had raised it, he now lowered the bow and commenced once more the slow dance, and the brutish ape-man allegedly continued to do this several more times, aiming the bow only to continue with his odd disjointed dance, and then aim it again. However, Fawcett seemed to know that at any point, the arrow could unleash and his hand was firmly kept upon the butt of his pistol as he took in the whole outlandish scene. 
At some point, Fawcett says he began to seriously fear for his life and decided to try scaring it off with his sidearm, shooting off a round that just pinged the earth by the beast's feet and sent a thunderous boom echoing through the jungle. He says this of the sequence of events. I drew out a Mauser pistol I had on my hip. It was a big clumsy thing of a caliber unsuitable for forest use, but I had brought it because by clipping the wooden holster to the pistol but it became a carbine and was lighter to carry than a true rifle. It used 38 black powder shells, which made a den out of all proportion to their size. I never raised it. I just pulled the trigger and banged it off into the ground at the ape man's feet. The effect was instantaneous. A look of complete amazement came onto his hideous face, and the little eyes opened wide. He dropped his bow and arrow and sprang away as quickly as a cat to vanish behind a tree. Then the arrows began to fly. We shot off a few rounds into the branches hoping the noise would scare the savages into a more receptive frame of mind, but they seemed in no way disposed to accept us. And before anyone was hurt, we gave it up as hopeless and retreated down the trail till the camp was out of sight. We were not followed but the clamor in the village continued for a long time as we struck off northwards. And we fancied we still heard the ug, ug, of the enraged braves. This account may seem to be completely sensational to the point that it might be easy for the more skeptical-minded to dismiss it out of hand. But there are a few reasons why it has warrant and deserves consideration. The first being that this was likely not some fictional story Fawcett was telling. It was part of his very serious and typically meticulous notes on his expedition and sitting right there amongst more mundane observations of the wildlife and region's peoples. He was a consummate professional and a member of the Royal Geographic Society. As well as a very respected, experienced explorer and surveyor. And there is no rational reason at all for why he should want to concoct such a story to drop in the middle of his otherwise meticulous journal. Why would he do that and risk his reputation? To what ends? Also, this means he would not likely have made misidentifications of local tribes or wildlife, as he was familiar with these jungles as one could possibly be in that era. Fawcett has also been accused of perhaps exaggerating his dealings with the natives and, in this case, portraying them as Harry Bruce for some racist agenda. But if that were the case, then why are there other records of his dealings with locals that are completely accurate in their depiction of their appearances and behavior? It is somewhat true that Fawcett was known to have strong opinions on the more primitive tribes, but he seems to have never let it compromise the matter-of-fact way in which he recorded the people themselves. Sanders has much to say about this aspect of the journal entries, writing, Fawcett was not an ethnologist, anthropologist, or archaeologists, but it was with these disciplines that he clashed, and it was towards the protagonists of the first that he most often expressed himself as feeling most bitter. In his extensive travels through hitherto unexplored territories, he discovered many groups of people for the first time, lived with them, often acquired not a little of their language, recorded what of their customs he could, and attempted some classification of their origins. Much of all of this conflicted with established beliefs among ethnologists, and Fawcett's historical theories were at complete variance with what was then and still is accepted. Yet, while those theories were strongly criticized, the veracity of the facts he collected were never questioned. It was his assessment of them that was considered invalid. That puts his account of the Marikoshis in an entirely different light, quite apart from the fact that his word was never doubted that he had two reliable witnesses and that what he saw was both before and afterward confirmed by others. Reports relayed to him by several people described exactly what he had seen without the relators knowing anything of what he did see. We are therefore compelled to accept this report in total. This means simply that in the year 1914, there were living to the northeast of the Parecis Range in the Mato Grosso what were apparently tribal groups of fully-haired hominids of grossly primitive aspect and in no possible way descended from or related to the Amerindian Aborigines of the Americas. While Sanders may seem perhaps too quick to buy the whole tale, it certainly is an account that stands out among Fawcett's writings and which ultimately leaves more questions than answers.
What did Fawcett and his fellow expedition members encounter out there in the jungle? Were these indeed the legendary Marikoshi or something else? It is truly unfortunate that considering Fawcett was not particularly interested in following up on it, and seems to have considered it mostly an obstacle and oddity, he never made any effort to find out what they were. The creatures of his account just sort of fade into the background to remain perplexing enigmas. Did these creatures really exist the way Fawcett described them? And if so, what were they? And how did they fit into the Marikoshi legend? The answer may forever remain hidden out there in that forbidden jungle where. Tragically, there are countless missing persons in the world today, and each is an awful reality for their loved ones. Every now and then, however, something truly incredible happens, and a previously missing person suddenly shows back up seemingly out of nowhere. Sometimes they have incredible stories to tell, and other times, they have no recollection of where they'd been or what had happened. This seems to happen more often with young children who vanish into thin air, then reappear, as though they never left, often returning with strange tales that are as strange as they are unexplainable. The oldest such instance of this phenomenon is the story of six-year-old Lillian Carney, who went missing in Maine in August of 1897. She'd been out picking blueberries with her parents when she apparently vanished. A search that began in the immediate area would eventually come to include 200 volunteers who searched high and low in the area in which she'd gone missing. After nearly two days of constant searching, Lillian was discovered in the woods in a dreamlike daze. She was confused but was able to answer questions. When asked where she'd been, she amazingly replied that she'd been in a place in the forest where the sun had never stopped shining on her. This was impossible, as she'd been missing overnight, and had also gone missing under overcast skies and was found in the deepest part of the forest, where she'd been surrounded by trees, and the floor was quite dark. What could explain her experience of continuous sunshine? What might this mean about her disappearance and reemergence? This mystery remains unsolved. A similarly strange case is that of eight-year-old Austin Anstrom, who disappeared into the wild near a small village in Sweden called Orstu, southwest of Kalspa. It was 1922, and Austin was walking along his usual route home from school with a classmate when the two decided to go play together. By 3.30, Austin was on his way home alone, a path that he'd taken many times and was quite familiar with. However, he never arrived safely at home, and by 7.30, his worried parents sent his older brother Gustav out in search for him. Austin's classmate reported that he'd left at 3.30, but even after walking along the entire route, Gustav didn't find a single clue that suggested something had happened to his brother. Resigned, Gustav headed home to deliver the bad news to his parents, and was shocked to find Austin already at home. He'd taken a shortcut through the woods when something truly incredible happened. He said that all of a sudden, the forest seemed to burst into life with countless creatures crawling and running out of every tree and bush. Suddenly, everything turned dark quickly, as though it was late in the evening, instead of the afternoon. Then a strong acrid smell permeated the area, and when he looked up again, he was terrified to see something completely unexpected. In his own words, I looked up and noticed three gray objects hovering silently above me. They were so close I could have thrown a stone at them. The objects were pulsating as if they were breathing, and I saw two dark lines on them. A bit further away over the woods, another two objects were floating. They were bigger and darker than the ones above me. He explained that the next thing he remembered, he was lying on the ground in the dark, a short distance from his home, freezing cold and disoriented. In the sky, a pulsing light was retreating into the night, and everything around him had been definitely silent. He then walked into his house to tell his parents what had happened, and they thought it was just his wild imagination. Oddly, Gustav said that he thoroughly searched the road his brother had claimed to have woken up on but had not seen him anywhere. Of the intervening four hours from when he left his friend's house to when he stumbled into his own home, he had no memory. 
The boy would in later years be interviewed by Swedish ufologists Clays Fan and Andreas Olsen, and they would get a little more information out of Austin, who would explain to them. Where was I during those hours? I estimate having been gone around four and a half hours. I didn't arrive home until half past seven or eight o'clock in the evening. I almost got beaten because they believed I was lying. They sent me to bed, and I was better than four days in a fever. Probably I caught a cold lying on the road. It looked as if the objects were pulsating simultaneously, all three of them, just like octopus functioning. They take in water and move by blowing it out. It looked like the objects used the same technique. They moved in a very elegant way, changed direction, and appeared to steer with this pulsating. Where was I? Gustav cycled this way while I was lying there without seeing me. I have pondered on this so many times. What happened to this boy? Who knows? Moving on to later years. In the summer of 2013, two-year-old Amber Rose Smith vanished from right in front of her home in Nuevo County, Michigan. According to her father, he had been watching her play with the family's two dogs when he stepped inside momentarily to relieve himself. When he had gone back outside, she was nowhere to be seen and would not respond to her name being called. The dogs appeared not long after without Ember. An intensive search involving hundreds of volunteers and emergency workers was launched to no avail. And the next day, she was found around two miles from her home, standing in the middle of the road that had already been searched and staring into space. She was unable to express what had happened to her but seemed to definitely be in a state of shock and disorientation. It was odd since this was a two-year-old girl, and she had somehow managed to navigate her way through thick wilderness and frigid temperatures that had gripped the area that night. Sheriff Brian Boyd said of the strange incident, It's hard to imagine how a two-and-a-half-year-old can survive that distance through the woods with that kind of temperature. There's some that aren't convinced she walked that entire distance. Maybe she was dropped off. Those are things we might have to determine in the future. So what happened to these people? Is there some force out there lurking in the wilderness that draws people in? How can we come to any answers when the details seem so murky? There are plenty of strange vanishings out there, and they always skirt the periphery of the odd, evading any real answers. It all remains a rather weird corner of the world of the weird, and it looks likely that we will be forced to merely speculate on it for the time being. His story has garnered a lot of global attention for how strange it was. On May 26, 1828, in Nuremberg, Germany, a teenage boy was seen wandering the streets. He wasn't immediately recognized by neighbors, and when approached, seemed confused and disoriented. He was carrying with him a letter addressed to someone named Captain von Vesinig, 4th Squadron 6th Cavalry Regiment. The strange letter's claim was almost unbelievable. The boy bearing the letter, it said, had been taken in as an infant and educated at home. He had never once left that house. The boy desired to be a cavalry man as his father had been, and then the letter presented an ultimatum to von Vesenig. Take him in or hang him. There was another letter too, apparently from the boy's mother who identified him as Casper and reiterated that the boy's father had been a cavalryman but had passed away. What was strange was that both letters appeared to be written by the same person. When the boy himself was questioned, it was clear that communication with him would be very difficult. He was able to speak but would only repeat the phrase. I want to be a cavalryman as my father was, or the word, horse. When further questions were put to him, he would simply answer, Don't know. He would eat and drink only plain bread and water and refused everything else offered to him. As far as his social skills and personal hygiene, he seemed able to only enact the most basic tasks and was only somewhat literate. It seemed that the most useful thing he could convey was his full name written in childlike handwriting, Caspar Hauser. Besides the letters brought with him and his own handwritten name, nothing else was known about him. Due to the very limited information about him, the first assumptions about Caspar were that he had been raised among animals out in the wilderness. 
This was due to his poor social awareness and lack of communication abilities. But Casper's story began to take shape as he grew in his ability to communicate, and what he had to say was disturbing. He had essentially been raised in a dungeon, in a cramped, dank cell that was too short to stand up in. He lived there completely alone and slept each night on a bed made of straw. Bread and water were left for him each morning, but other than that, he ate nothing. He never left his cage, had never learned to walk as he'd been hunched over his entire life, and had never learned to talk. Bizarrely, he claimed that he had never actually met his caregiver in all the years that he'd been raised in the environment. In fact, he'd never met another human being. According to Casper, it was only quite recently that he'd been in contact with another human. He said that a man whose face was always obscured had taught him to write his name as well as how to walk. This person helped Casper to memorize the one sentence that he knew. I want to be a cavalryman, as my father was, which at the time meant nothing to Casper. He learned it by rote, memorizing the phonetic sounds and practicing them over and over. The fantastic story was soon in the media, and it didn't take long for Kasper Hauser to become world famous for his odd background. Theories began to emerge about him, with some suggesting he was royalty, and others claiming he was a liar. Kasper was kindly taken in by Friedrich Dahmer, a schoolmaster and philosopher who took him on as a student. Kasper studied a variety of academic subjects with Dahmer and began to adjust to his new life. However, there wasn't much more clarity around his mysterious beginnings. In fact, the veracity of his claims would be thrown into question as a series of strange events unfolded. On October 17, 1829, Casper didn't show up to a lunch appointment. And when he was searched for, he was found in the cellar with a cut on his forehead. He claimed to have been attacked by a man in a hood. When questioned, Casper said that the person who attacked him sounded like the man who had first taught him to speak and brought him to Nuremberg. Apparently, this cloaked man had threatened Casper and cut him with a knife before fleeing. It was then that Casper himself fled to the cellar, leaving behind a trail of blood. For his safety, Casper was moved to Johann Biberbuck's home, a municipal authority. The mysterious attacker was never apprehended but people began to wonder if the wound on his forehead had been self-inflicted. It soon became clear as well that Casper was not any safer in Biberbach's home as other strange things began to happen. On April 3, 1830, a gunshot was heard in Casper's room. He was found alive but bleeding from a head wound. He said he'd used a chair to climb up and read a book and had mistakenly knocked down a gun that had been hanging on the wall. The gun went off when it fell, he claimed. What was strange was that the wound on Casper's head didn't look like a gunshot wound. He was moved again and came to live with Baron Van Toucher, a landowner. It was around this time that Casper began to earn a reputation as a difficult person to be around. He was said to be unpleasant and even abrasive. Both Bieberback and Von Toucher were heard to complain about his behavior and character, saying that he was a liar disagreeable, and vain. In fact, Biberbach said that Casper was an expert in the art of dissimulation and was full of vanity and spite. His reputation souring, he also lost credibility, which led to even more speculation that the knife attack and supposed gunshot wound were staged in an attempt to win sympathy and attention. These suspicions were strengthened when a British nobleman named Lord Stan Hope decided to bring Casper into his home and investigate his background at considerable personal cost. Despite pouring resources into a search to uncover the details of Casper's early life, he came up with no evidence to support the claim that he'd been raised in a dungeon, alone. After another caretaker named George Meyer cut ties with Casper after just a short time in his company, he proclaimed, I have been deceived. And a further caretaker named Ansel von Forbach said, Kasper Hauser is a smart scheming codger, a rogue, a good for nothing that ought to be killed. The truth about Kasper's origins will never be known because he died before anyone could unearth what truly happened. On December 14, 1833, he returned home with a bad chest wound, 
which he said was from a knife attack in Anne's back court garden. When authorities went to the place where he said he'd been stabbed, they found a purse, and inside it, a strange cryptic note. It was written in a mirror code in German, but with grammatical and spelling errors. It read, Hauser will be able to tell you quite precisely how I look and from where I am. To save Hauser the effort, I want to tell you myself where I come from. I come from the Bavarian border on the river. I will even tell you the name MLO. To this day, the note has never been conclusively interpreted, and the person who wrote it has never been identified. It's not even clear if the person who wrote the note had a role to play in Casper's demise. He succumbed to the knife wound on December 17, 1833, dying a death as strange as his entire life had been. His gravestone in the city cemetery of Ansbach reads, Here lies Caspar Hauser, riddle of his time. His birth was unknown. His death mysterious 1833. Despite the time that has passed since his death, his life remains a seductive mystery, inviting both amateur and professional speculation as to the truth of his story. A popular theory near the time of his death was that he was a prince in disguise. It was claimed that Caspar was actually the Prince of Baden, who had been switched at birth with another baby. Caspar was imprisoned by the Countess of Hochberg in order to prevent anyone but her own sons ascending to the throne. This theory further claimed that this is the reason that Caspar was ultimately murdered. However, there is little evidence to prove this theory, and it has been dismissed by most historians. In light of the many inconsistencies and oddities of Caspar's story, there are others who believe that the whole thing was more or less a big scam carried out by Casper himself or that it was merely a tall tale woven by a possibly mentally impaired teenager. There are several issues that cast doubt on Casper's own version of events. One is that when he was found, he did not seem to exhibit any of the health issues that one would expect of someone who had lived their whole life in a cramped subterranean dungeon, as claimed. For instance, such a long uninterrupted period of time in absolute darkness should have most certainly resulted in rickets. Yet the record showed that Casper had no such condition, and in fact, he was described as being rather healthy looking with a vibrant complexion. He was also in good physical condition for someone who claimed that they had been unable to stand their whole life and had just learned to walk. And Casper was able to run and climb stairs with no particular difficulty. It seems that anyone who had lived under such harsh conditions for their entire life would likely have been paler, sicklier, less physically fit, and indeed far more mentally impaired than Casper seemed to be. It has also been pointed out that the letters he had been carrying when he was originally found bore handwriting that was cannily similar to his own. For these reasons, it's thought that the whole account of his previous life had been a fanciful fiction, that Casper was a pathological liar and that the attacks he suffered were also lies, and the wounds self-inflicted. Indeed, in this theory, the very knife wound that killed him may have been from Casper himself, and he had simply cut himself more deeply than he had intended. Other clues surrounding his death point to this possibility as well. For instance, the handwriting and grammatical mistakes of the note found in the garden from the alleged attackers were similar to Casper's and the letter had been folded in the same characteristic way that he folded other letters he had written. However, for all the speculation and theories, to this day, no one really knows for sure who Kasperhauser was, where he came from, how much of his story was true, or who really killed him. And the case continues to be a baffling enigma that puzzles to this day. In an eerily similar case, in 1851, a man calling himself Joseph Warren was found wandering about a village in the rural German district of Labos, near the town of Frankfurt on the Oder. Thinking he was a vagrant drifter, authorities approached the stranger and asked him where he had come from. The stranger, who appeared to be Caucasian, answered in broken German that he was from a faraway country called Lexaria, which he claims could be found out over the seas in a region he identified as Sacria either of which were real places that anyone had ever heard of. When he was detained and brought to Frankfurt for further questioning, things got more bizarre still. 
Voren was found to be unfamiliar with any other European language, except German, of which he had only a rudimentary grasp. But he claimed to be a native speaker to unintelligible languages, which he said were called Laxarian and Abramian, with one being the written language of the clerical order of Laxaria, and the other the common language of his people. The stranger was apparently very persuasive, explaining the geography of his country and even his religion, which he called as patient in great detail. Furthermore, he claimed that he had been searching for his missing brother but that he had become shipwrecked on his journey and had ended up in Germany. It seems that, in the end, the baffled authorities came to the conclusion that he was telling the truth and released him. In 1905 in Paris, France, another such stranger was apprehended when he tried unsuccessfully to pilfer a loaf of bread from a marketplace. When questioned by police, the man claimed in imperfect French that he was from a country called Lisbia. It was at first thought he was trying to say Lisbon, and a Portuguese translator was brought in to help police further question him in more detail. However, the stranger did not speak a word of Portuguese and indeed did not even seem to be able to locate the country on a map. The man humored authorities by speaking in what he claimed to be his native language, and although it seemed to follow basic rules of syntax and have its own vocabulary, no one had ever heard of it before, and indeed, no linguist was able to place it. Unfortunately, the authorities could not do much to keep him, and when he had been sternly warned about attempted theft, he was released. This is another case for which it's hard to ascertain the parts which could be true or fabricated, and which will probably always remain a curious puzzle. Another story, similarly rendered muddy and murky by the passage of time and retellings, is a strange appearance in Mexico City on October 26, 1593, of a Spanish soldier who seems to have appeared out of thin air after being teleported over vast distances. On the day in question, Guards at Mexico City's Plaza Mayor noticed a dazed-looking man walking about in a trance and wearing the uniform of a Philippine soldier. In addition to him being very far from the Philippines, no one figured out how the intruder could have possibly slipped past the high security of the premises. And the suspicious guards immediately detained him. When the stranger was questioned, he had quite a fantastic story to tell. He claimed that his name was Gil Perez, a soldier and guard at the Governor General in Manila, Philippines. And then on October 23, 1593, he had been at his post on high alert following the shocking assassination of Governor Don Gomez Perez Perez des Marines. Exhausted, Perez had allegedly leaned on a wall and closed his eyes for a moment. But when he opened them again, he was in an unfamiliar place surrounded by new sights and smells. Disoriented, Perez nevertheless had dutifully gone back to his guard detail, until he realized that his uniform was not the same as the guards around him, which was around when he had been apprehended. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the skeptical Mexican guards did not believe a word of this spectacular tale, and Perez was simply thrown into prison and accused of being a servant of the devil. Perez languished in prison for months until a ship arrived from the Philippines along with news of the Manila governor's assassination, which had until that point been unknown in Mexico. Further corroborating Perez's story was the testimony of someone on the ship who claimed to know Perez and to have actually seen him on duty on October 23rd, although it was not known that he had gone to Mexico. Considering that he had been detained since the 26th of October and that he could not possibly have known of the assassination, since the news had taken months to travel across the ocean by ship, as well as the claims by those on the ship who apparently knew him. The Mexican authorities had no choice but to grudgingly believe him. In light of this information, the Mexican authorities then reportedly released him and allowed him to go home. This time, the long way by ship. It's not known if Perez was really who he claimed to be, and indeed, it is uncertain just how much of this story is true, if any, or what parts may have been exaggerated or fabricated over retellings. But theories by those who put stock in it include the ideas that he was simply a lying imposter or a deserter, to spontaneous teleportation, interdimensional portals, 
or even alien abduction. So what are we to make of all of this? In these disparate stories of mysterious strangers who have appeared from seemingly nowhere, do we have in some instances cases of such oddities as time travel, interdimensional portals, and spontaneous teleportation? Is there truly something at work here that goes beyond what we know of our universe? With these people somehow walking the line on the limits of reality, transcending the horizons of what we think we understand of time and space. In other cases such as that of Caspar Hauser, do we have a true tale of intrigue? Or merely the ramblings of a swindling degenerate liar? Is any of this possibly real? Or is this all just urban legend, tall tales, and exaggeration over time? With some of these people having never really even existed at all. Who were these inscrutable strangers? What did they come from? And what did they want? There is a multitude of questions raised in cases like these to which we are like doomed to never know the answers to, with the clues fading into legend and obscurity, vanishing just as surely as these mysterious people allegedly appeared. Throughout time, there have been oddities and strange occurrences that have puzzled us. Sometimes there is insufficient documentation of the phenomena, or there is simply not enough interest in it. But for whatever reason, they are lost to time. Some stories are of strange tribes of people around the world who, before we have a chance to learn more about them. An example of this type of mystery is a Native American tribe who it's claimed looked European, even though their culture is now unknown. Although we have historical accounts of such people, the details remain foggy, and it's not clear whose ancestors they were. In fact, we may never know the full truth. In the days of the first European contact with what we now call North America, the native people captivated their European colonizers who were mystified by the culture customs and traditions of the locals. They were alternately curious and fearful of what they saw in the new cultures that they sought to overtake. The lives and customs of these people weren't always completely foreign. However, and strange accounts exist of native people who appear to have Caucasian features. This band of tribal people came to be called the Mandans, and the first reports of contact with them came from French explorers who were traveling in what is now North and South Dakota in the Missouri River region in the early 17th century. The indigenous people spotted there had fair skin and blonde hair, sometimes even red hair. They were said to have gray and blue eyes, and the women were apparently so Nordic-looking that it was only their clothing that distinguished them from Europeans. The French-Canadian trader Sierra de Laveranger is said to have made the first official contact with the Mandan people in 1738. He reported that the tribe lived in nine villages along the Hart River, a tributary of the Missouri. He noted that the Mandan people displayed customs and culture that were strangely European in nature much more so than other nearby tribes. The tribe was mentioned in the media in 1784, and their popularity grew from there. The Pennsylvania Packet and Daily Advertiser ran a story about blue-eyed Indians, as they called them, who it described were acquainted with the principles of the Christian religion and extremely courteous and civilized. Lewis and Clark themselves came across the tribe at one point in 1804 and claimed that they were half-white using terms like civilized and polite to describe them. Lewis and Clark also noticed that the tribe's population was in steep decline due to the smallpox epidemics that were ravaging native tribes during that time. They were also likely victims of attacks by their neighbors, the Assiniboine, Lakota, Arikara, and the Sioux. There was understandably speculation about how Caucasians managed to be on the continent before any European expeditions had reached it. One theory was that the tribe was actually the descendants of early explorers, with some claiming that Welsh settlers had made it to the so-called New World as early as the 12th century. A legend states that Prince Maddock emigrated to what is now the United States in about 1170. A Welshman named John Evans was particularly wedded to this theory and set out to prove it. In 1796, by launching an expedition on the Missouri to make contact and study their language in order to determine whether it had Welsh origins. His search for Welsh influence proved fruitless, and he conceded that the Mandans did not, in fact, come from early Welsh settlers. 
In fact, he suggested that these Caucasian-looking Indians may not exist at all, writing to Dr. Samuel Jones, thus having explored and charted the Missouri for 1,800 miles and by my communications with the Indians, this side of the Pacific Ocean, from 35 to 49 degrees of latitude, I am able to inform you that there is no such people as the Welsh Indians. George Catlin, another explorer, wasn't ready to give up so easily and stayed committed to the idea that the Mandan existed and had European roots. He lived among the tribe in North Dakota for several months in 1832, drawing and painting them and their environment. He claimed that the people looked shockingly European, some of them with white hair and light eyes. He also said that they had particularly advanced techniques for building and manufacturing, as well as sophisticated town layouts, customs, and traditions, and were set apart from nearby tribes in their language. Here's what he said about them. They are very interesting and pleasing people in their appearance and manners, differing in many respects, both in looks and customs from all the other tribes I have seen. So forcibly, have I been struck with the peculiar case and elegance of these people together with their diversity of complexions, the various colors of their hair and eyes, the singularity of their language, and the peculiarity and unaccountable customs that I am fully convinced that they have sprung from some other region than that of other North American tribes, or that they are an amalgam of natives with some civilized race. Even some of the legends of the Mandan people themselves expressly mention that they had been descended from a strange white man who had appeared to them aboard a canoe in ancient times after an enormous flood had wiped out everything in sight. They claimed that this stranger had taught them about medicine and had influenced their religion, which oddly featured many of the same beats as Christianity, such as a great flood, a virgin birth, and a child born who could work magical miracles, among others. This was noticed by other later expeditions as well, such as an 1833-34 expedition led by German naturalist A.P. Maximilian, who felt that the similarities between Christianity and the Mandan religion were too close to be mere coincidence. Catlin would write of this, It would seem that these people must have had some proximity to some part of the civilized world, or that missionaries or others have been formerly among them including the Christian religion and the Mosaic account of the flood. Another idea on the Mandan origins is that they came from pre-Columbian visitations by Viking explorers. The first official European to ever make contact with the Mandan tribe, Sierra de la Vendriae, claimed that at the time, he had found a strange runestone with Nordic inscriptions on a riverside near the village. The stone was allegedly sent to France to be studied, but it's unclear what happened to the runestone after that, and indeed, it's uncertain if it ever really existed at all. Unless the stone ever turns up again, it remains just as mysterious as the Mandan. The idea of Vikings in the New World before the days of Columbus has been talked about for some time, with one prevalent and somewhat controversial theory having to do with Eric Turvalson, also more famously known as the Red who established two colonies on the coast of Greenland in 968. The story goes that Eric the Red then abandoned these outposts when the wild, rugged land proved to be too cold and forbidding and made his way to North America along with the colonists. The theory then claims that the King of Norway is said to have sent an expedition to the New World to find out what happened to them, and that this expedition made their way up the rivers to end up in the Dakotas and other areas after which they became stranded and then assimilated into the native tribes, giving them their Nordic genes. However, there is very little evidence to prove that Vikings ever actually reached North America. The Virendry runestone vanished without a trace. And then there is the hotly debated Kensington runestone, which was a giant slab covered in ruins allegedly found by Swedish immigrant Olaf Ullmann in Minnesota in 1898. In this case, the inscriptions claim that the runes had been created by 14th century Scandinavian explorers, and although the authenticity of the runestone is still debated, it has mostly been classified as a hoax by the scientific community. Regardless of where the Mandan really came from, the fact is we will probably never know for sure. In 1838, the tribe was hit by a devastating smallpox epidemic. And although this was a specter they had been haunted by for centuries, this time, it was absolutely catastrophic. 
wiping them out at such a rate that after only a few months, there were an estimated 30 to 140 of them left. With the Mandan teetering on the edge of extinction, enemy tribes swept in and took them as slaves, after which they were assimilated and absorbed. Consequent intermarriage and interbreeding meant that any unique genetic heritage they may have had was quickly erased, and the last known full-blooded Mandan was a Maddie Grinnell who died in 1971. Since there are no more full-blooded Mandan left, and only an estimated eight speakers of its language left today, it's difficult to get a grip on their heritage. Even with our advanced DNA testing techniques, their origins and history will likely forever remain shrouded in mystery, leaving us to merely speculate and debate on it. It is somewhat sad that this tribe disappeared before we were ever able to really comprehend who they were. All we are left with is the tales and accounts from explorers. But other than their legacy has evaporated into the tides of history. They are advantaged people who sowed bafflement and wonder, but ultimately left numerous questions swirling about them doomed to a limbo of superstition, speculation, and rumor. Who were these people? Why did they look and act so differently? And what was the meaning behind their strange ways? To the alien explorers just starting to penetrate this wilderness at the time, they may have seemed to be baffling anomalies, and interestingly, they still are. Everyone's got a hobby. Some small way that we like to while away our leisure time. For most of us, these are frivolous things, like video games, or TV trivia, meditation, or crafting. But some people are overtaken by a deep, compulsive desire to pour all of themselves into something bizarre, often something that others just can't understand. One of the most fascinating examples of these types of all-consuming hobbies belongs to the postman in France who spent more than 30 years building an entire palace out of rocks that he sourced from nearby. The otherwise normal life of Ferdinand and Chavo began in 1836 when he was born into a poor family of farmers in the Charmes de la Basse region of France. Ferdinand dropped out of school when he was quite young in order to pursue a baking apprenticeship. He would eventually become a postman, and his life was straightforward and pleasant by all accounts. In fact, he was such a normal man that he would most certainly have been lost to history, had it not been for his strange hobby. It's reported that he had a vision one day, a vivid strange dream in which he saw himself building a gigantic perfect castle. In this lucid dream, he was able to see intricate details of the construction, aware of the placement of each stone. While he was dreaming, Chavel had the intense feeling that it was real. And he knew even before he awoke that it was his destiny to build the castle in his dream. The dream castle stayed with Chavel for many years after the dream itself. And even though it faded from the top of his mind, it would suddenly be present again on a day in 1879 as he was on his usual 18-mile post route. He tripped, and his foot caught on a stone that was a strange shape. Here are his own words. One day in April 1879, I was doing my rounds as a rural postman, a quarter of a league before reaching their son. I was walking quickly when my foot cut something that sent me tumbling a few meters away. I wanted to know what had caused it. I was very surprised to see that I had brought a stone out of the earth. It was of such a bizarre and yet picturesque skit shape that I looked around me. I saw that it was not alone. I took it and wrapped it in my handkerchief and carefully took it away with me, promising myself to take advantage of the free time that my rounds would leave me to set in a store of them. The next day I went back to the same place. I found more stones, even more beautiful. I gathered them together on the spot and was overcome with delight. It's a sandstone shaped by water and hardened by the power of time. It becomes hard as pebbles. It represents a sculpture so strange that it's impossible for man to imitate. It represents any kind of animal, any kind of caricature. I said to myself, since nature is willing to do the sculpture, I will do the masonry and the architecture. The very next day, he began the project that would consume him for 30 years, picking up stones as he went along his postal route. He was fueled by an obsession with the hyper-realistic dream he'd had of his castle and stuffed his pockets with stones at first, 
eventually bringing along a basket, and then ultimately a wheelbarrow. He brought the stones back to his home. And when he felt he'd brought back enough, he set out building his dream castle, one stone at a time. He called it Pala Ideal. The son of farmers, he had no knowledge or experience with design, architecture, or construction. But he had his passion. He began the building with a simple waterfall, and it would serve as the main focal point of his overarching vision for the structure. He wrote, From then on, I had no rest day or night. I set out to find some more. Sometimes I did five or six kilometers, three or four miles. And when I was loaded up, I carried them on my back. I began to dig a pool in which I started to sculpt very different species of animal with cement. Then I started to make a waterfall with my stones. It took me two years to build. Once it was finished, I was amazed with my work. Criticized by the locals but encouraged by foreign visitors, I did not lose heart. I had discovered other stones, each more beautiful than the other in St. Martin du in Trezio and in St. Germain. They were like little round balls. I set to work. He spent the next 33 years in search of the perfect stones, rocks, and boulders for his dream palace. He worked constantly, carefully placing each stone by hand, and using homemade cement, lime, and mortar. The castle was finally completed in 1912, and was 33 feet tall at its highest point and 85 feet wide. Visitors exclaimed that it looked like something out of a fairy tale. It boasts huge support beams and columns and a pair of waterfalls. There are spiral staircases and spires, towers, and mosaics throughout. The ceilings soar, and each room features statues of animals or mythological creatures. There are also engravings throughout the castle, one of which reads 1879 to 1912. 10,000 days. 93,000 hours, 33 years of struggle. Let those who think they can do better try. At the end of the project, Chavel was so pleased with his creation that he decided he wanted to be buried within it. However, the French government would not allow it. So he set about again collecting rocks to build a mausoleum, in addition to a full-sized Hindu temple at the Hotel Rivet Cemetery. Here's what he said about the finishing touches that he took to complete this project. Still more delighted with my work, the idea then came to me that with my little round balls that I had found in St. German, Trojet, and St. Martin Duet, I could make myself an Egyptian tomb whose style would be unique in the world and be buried in the rock just like the pharaohs. I started digging into the earth, and I formed a kind of rock. And in this rock I dug coffins. These coffins are covered with tiles that you can remove at will. Them themselves closed off by a stone door, and an iron one. On this underground rock, I built the monument that is 12 feet wide and 15 feet long. The monument is supported by eight walls made of stones that have the most picturesque shape. I worked night and day for another seven years to finish it. I carried the stones on my back, sometimes 15 kilometers, mostly at night. Still, to fill my spare time and for the symmetry of the monument, I wanted to add a Hindu temple whose interior is a real cave and this cave formed several small ones. And in these small caves I placed the fossils I had found in the earth. On the other side, three giants and two mummies, all Egyptian. And above there are two prickly pears, palms, olives, and an aloe. You reach the top of the tower by a spiral staircase. At the entrance of the staircase are four barbarous columns. I took another four years to build this Hindu temple. It's all very impressive, encompassing many artistic and architectural styles. And all of it was built with what he gathered himself with his own hands, all completely self-taught. Not a well-traveled man, many of these designs and influences, Chavel had never even seen before, outside of pictures in the newspapers and magazines he delivered in the mail, but he pulled it all off beautifully. It was all so incredible that during the construction, he was known to draw crowds of curiosity seekers. And he had gained the attention and praise of artists such as poet André Vitan and painter Pablo Picasso. 
What had begun as a half-forgotten dream and chance discovery of a weird-looking rock had over decades become a sprawling, immense, and ornate castle, exerting great cultural and artistic influence across France. Cheval would die on August 19, 1924, and be buried in his beloved mausoleum, after which his legend grew among artists and architects, especially surrealists, who came in droves to look upon his labor of love. In 1969, André Malou, the Minister of Culture, declared Chavel's Palace a cultural landmark, and the structure continues to draw in over a hundred thousand visitors a year. What drove Chabal? What made him so fully devote himself to this endeavor that lasted nearly a lifetime, and required true devotion from beginning to end to become an iconic landmark in France? How is it that this uneducated, untraveled man managed such a feat of architecture all by himself? It is all truly a weird historical oddity and a testament to the human will to follow through, no matter what the odds. What did you do with your free time today?